Hit it. It's March 20th, 2020, episode 72. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week we have David Keller from StockCharts.com to give us a technical update on what's happening in the markets today. And then we have my favorite segment, Talking Charts with Patrick. And sorry, no market history this week, but we will get to the top three things to watch. So joining us now is David Keller, the chief market strategist at StockCharts.com and the chief strategist at uh, Sierra Alpha Research. Now, David prepared a great chart deck that we will be referencing throughout the interview. You can find that chart deck uh, in the Market Huddle weekly email. And if you have not registered your email, make sure you go to markethuddle.com. It's free to register. So, David, I'm welcoming you to the show after the worst uh, one week drop in the market since Lehman. Now, uh, there is so much for us to talk about. So welcome to the show. Absolutely. No, it's a pleasure to be on here. Now, uh, we'd like to start the interview with some personal questions so our listeners get to know you. So uh, where did you go to school and how did you get started in this business? Sure. So I grew up for the most part in Northeast Ohio and I went to uh, the Ohio State University and I, I had a very traditional um path of studying music and psychology as an undergrad. <laughs> and I say that with a great amount of sarcasm um, because I, I was struggling to justify those degrees to my parents and, and somehow have managed to find a path in the financial industry that leverages both of those, which is, which is pretty <laughs> awesome. Um, but basically, out of, after uh, undergrad, I got hired by Bloomberg uh, in New York City. And so you know, working on the market data side and, and what they did was they hired about 50 percent liberal arts majors 50% uh, finance and econ majors. And after spending a lot of time together, the finance and econ guys sort of helped me understand what stocks were and how the economy works and what the Fed does and bond math. And I helped them learn how to ask better questions and how to listen and how to speak better. And in the end, we were kind of pretty well-rounded about understanding what was going on. Um, but it's funny, music and, and psych is a, is a funny background for what I do, but it, it works. Mm -hmm. The psychology I hit all the time because I found what I do, it's all about getting inside other investors' heads and understanding what motivates their buy and sell decisions. And somehow the tool that I learned is really well equipped for that. Um, and then music, there's a creative part to music, but there's also a very mathematical part, component to music. And so I think the statistical part of what I do actually taps on that same uh, thing that inspired it, it, it pre, that I appreciated about the mathematical nature of, of, of music and octaves and, and notes and their relationships. Um, so, so somehow the two of those together make you a good technical analyst as far as far as I can tell. <laughs> now, uh, you were the uh, managing director of research at uh, Fidelity Investments in Boston, and you uh, managed the technical research department and the legendary Fidelity chart room. And I had to ask you, wh okay, what, what is the legendary Fidelity chart room and what was it like? Yeah. So it, it, if there's one thing I absolutely miss, I mean, two things, I miss the people that I, I worked with. So I worked with some really sharp people up there. I was there from 2008 to 2016. Uh, it was eight and a half years. And uh, getting to work with people like Peter Lynch and, and Bruce Johnstone and, and Bruce Herring and a number of other and Will Danoff. And I mean, just really, um, you know, successful money managers was was a humbling and great learning experience. And we had a team of 13 technical analysts. It was the biggest buy side technical research team anywhere uh, from what we could tell. And our job was to understand the markets visually sent with sentiment, with psychological indicators, all those things, and help visualize risk versus return. And we had this great physical space called the chart room. And we bought, we brought probably 2,500 to 3,000 Fidelity clients through that space every year. But we also used it a lot for, uh, for our internal use for um, you know, analyzing the markets. We had a, you know, 13 foot plasma screen. We would put, you know, huge charts and debate, have bull bear debates about things. We'd be able to visualize someone's entire portfolio, sit down with a money manager and discuss where there were opportunities to rotate in and out of positions. And just, a, it was a beautiful, big physical repository of, uh, of market history. And one of the charts, the first chart, when you'd walk in the room, this is some of the charts that traditionally was all done by pen and paper. And so there were these big wall sized paper charts that we still were maintaining and, and now thankfully with computers. Um, but the, uh, the one was the U S stock market back to the late 1700s. And so wow. there was this great history, not just the 2008, you know, bottom, but talk about like the banking crisis of 19, you know, 1907 or something like that, looking at the great depression era, but really looking at the charts and what actually happened. It was a, it was a fantastic historical reference of market uh, bull and bear phases. 
Well, you know what's funny that you mentioned that is uh, uh, most people stop uh, going back in history to uh, 1929. They basically go back to 1929, but they rarely go uh, farther back. But really, that that uh, panic of 1907 was truly like this historical uh, period where where there's just so much information and so few people ever go back there. So I, to be honest, I don't even know where to find the charts for that kind of stuff. The fact that you guys kept that, that's awesome. Yeah. So, you know, one of my predecessors there, I mean, the, the technical research team actually predated the fundamental research team at Fidelity. The first analyst they hired was a, was a chart person to analyze, you know, as a market strategist. And so they did a great job early on in the 60s and 70s, piecing together a lot of deep historical data that we were able to keep going. All right, Dave. Now, uh, we are both CMTs, and uh, we, we uh, love to look at charts and do some technical analysis. But uh, you have one up on me because uh, you were the past president of the CMT Association. Uh, what year were you uh, president? Yeah, so I joined the board for, first in 2007 and then ended up being vice president soon after that. And then I was president from 2010 to 2014. Wow, that's that's the distance. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, uh, I think I think technical analysis in general is uh, is uh, misunderstood by many. Uh, like, do you, as as past president, like, what do you find is the most common misconceptions that the general public has about technical analysis? And and uh, you know, how do you uh, approach ever uh, you know trying to validate it as a, a, a valuable way of approaching the markets? So it's so funny because I started in the industry in mid 2000 and, you know, leading up to that point, really leading up to the tech bubble mid 90s, you know, technical analysis was sort of a pariah type of, uh, of approach in the industry. I mean, it was certainly not taught at the college level. It was certainly not, you know, uh, at least openly used at most places. It was sort of I, I feel like there are a lot of closet chartists out there, but not a lot of people that were explicitly using technical analysis. But a number of things changed to sort of uh, uh, make it to be to become more mainstream. Um, one of them is the growth in the hedge fund industry. So you have hedge funds that are designing trading systems ba based almost purely on price trends. And so there's a whether or not they would call it technical analysis, it's a very price driven analysis and has a lot of the same approaches. Right. Um, I would say the second big thing is the growth in behavioral finance. So when I started, any academic research I could find, but with 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 very limited exceptions, like Andrew Lowe uh, at MIT, Carol Osler at Brandeis, you know, some of them had written articles supporting technical analysis, but the overwhelming majority of academic literature talked about how useless it was, and that's all changed. If you look at what's coming out of academia now in the recent five to ten years. It's all about the momentum factor and how persistent it is and how price has meaning and price has information. And it's sort of like I feel in some ways technical analysis has been validated and behavioral finance is what's created that. We, we sort of had this series of patterns and trends that we followed and that we traded on. But we didn't really have an academic backing to say why it should work. And now I could point to tons of articles and tons of, you know, uh, journal, uh, you know, peer reviewed articles that explain why trends persist and how investors are irrational and why the markets are not efficient. And that was not the case 20 years ago. So, so I think overall it has started to evolve. I still think, you know, at the, I, I used to teach technical analysis at the master's level at, at Brandeis University outside of Boston. And I would say still the overwhelming majority of MBAs coming out of their program do not get a lot of exposure to technical analysis. But the good news is I think that's evolving. And, and over time, I think what it does is it empowers investors, which is what I like about it. Well, you know, I, I love the fact that you're connecting technical analysis with behavioral finance because I personally love uh, looking at it that way because uh, fundamentals to me is the understanding of the business and the comparative valuations. But the technical analysis is sort of a map of investor behavior and how they're voting with their money. And so the chart, you can uh, you you can see the, the behavior of how everything connects. And so understanding behavior and then using the charts, it's, a, it's a, an additional tool for helping kind of determine what are the trends and which way the markets are going. I mean, you, you, want, you need some roadmap for how you make active decisions, right? You know, so two ways I would, I, I totally agree. And two things I would add to that. The first is, you know, the way that the CMT Association is, has, has sort of articulated that is technical analysis navigates the gap between the fundamental valuation and price, right? So 
if you look at how um, you know investing is taught at the end to most in the average MBA, it's basically that the price or the value of a stock reflects all known information. And essentially, when new information is introduced, the price will immediately go to that new value. Like that is the definition of a rational, efficient market. But you and I know that's not at all how the markets actually work. And what you have mm -hmm. is you have a group of people that you learn finance, then you go into the markets and you see how it actually works. And there's this movement, you know, stocks just don't immediately go from valuation one to valuation two. They overshoot, they undershoot, people get aggressive, they get too passive. And as a result, things fluctuate. And so what technical analysis does is it helps you understand that transition. And over the long term, I would agree that prices tend to go to the, the fundamental value where it should be for a company, but it doesn't just go straight to it. There's a fluctuation. I think that's pretty important to, to remember. The, the second thing I would say is in this environment, in this bear market phase that we've been thrust in now in the last uh, you know four to six weeks, it, you, know, you cannot tell me by looking at anything that's happening right now, this is driven by rational investment behavior. It, just, it isn't. There's no way you could convince me otherwise. Yeah. It's driven by fear. And on the upside, it's been the FOMO. It's been the fear of missing out. On the downside, it's the fear of losing and the fear of losing everything. And, and fear is what is motivating people's buy and sell decisions right now. And in a bear market phase, when it feels like a falling knife, that is exhibit A as to how the markets are you know, inefficient at times because investors are irrational and their their emotions are driving their investment decisions. It's not a rational review of uh, of their investment data. Right, and so you so you studied psychology, you studied behavioral finance. So why don't you give uh, our, our listeners a little tidbit? Like, what is the uh, behavior, like a characteristic that is incredibly common amongst all of the successful traders that you've met? Like, what what is the what, is there a commonality of something that you see psychologically or from behavior that that you see in all of them? That's actually a fantastic question. Thanks for asking it that way. Um, you know, a common theme when I and I've had the pleasure of meeting, you know, some really talented investors and, and others, guys like Steve Cohen and, you know, Tom DeMarc, who I think of as a, as a mentor, Ralph Acampora is a, you know, successful strategist. I've gotten to know a lot of these guys over, over the years. And if there's one thing that I, I would say is I found that the best, most consistent investors have a good self-awareness. Uh, which I would include as a as a key part of being a good behavioral investor is having an awareness of yourself and what you're good at, what you what you're not. I find unsuccessful investors are the ones that, even given their own weaknesses, they don't compensate for those, and so as a result, they make poor decisions because they're not aware of where they have opportunity to outperform and where they're just going to get crushed based because they're not well equipped to do it. Whether they don't have a good routine or they don't have the right process to be able to be successful there. I found the best investors have a good self-awareness. And what that means is you know what you're good at and what you're not. And you set yourself in, in an investment role that magnifies, that that benefits from your strengths and minimizes the uh, the exposure that you get from your weaknesses. And you address your weaknesses in a couple of ways. One is you, you know, you develop routines to help you focus more on, on your strengths and, and address those weaknesses. You surround yourself with people that compensate. So if you're not very well organized, you get an assistant who's very well organized and that keeps you, you know, that addresses that weakness. So the best investors I found have a good, they will tell you what they're good at and what they're not. And they have found a way to put themselves in a position that they're going to do well based on those strengths and compensated for those weaknesses. Right. And then uh, and, and to reverse it, then uh, one of those traders that struggle or fail, like, is there a common error you see from a psychological perspective that they seem to repeat that they see, can, they can't get over? Like, is it, what's the hurdle that most uh, is a common error amongst investors that struggle? Yeah. You know, so for me, I've worked with a lot of investors. I've also, also worked, I've coached a lot of financial advisors who you know, are trying to, you know, depending on how they structure their practice, they're trying to, you know, uh, have a good investment process, how to understand the markets and communicate that well. And and one of the things I find pretty consistently is a poor investment routine is how I would describe it. So, you know, there is a process of things that I do every morning and there is an order of how I consume information. There's a way I prioritize things every week. There are certain things that I do every Friday that I do every Sunday and I try never to miss those. And because of those routines, now, now obviously me being a technical analyst, they're, they're understandably very visual. So I'm looking at a lot of charts. I have a, a daily chart routine that I go through. I call it a morning coffee routine. 
I have a weekly routine on Sundays, on Fridays that I do. Um, and doing that routine consistently is what's kept me, I think, focus on the right things and making sure that I keep coming back to that sort of true north principle. What am I trying to actually do as an analyst, as an investor? And I think the people that do that, that struggle are ones that don't have a great routine. They don't have a good routine for, um, you know, preparing for a trade. They don't have a consistent game plan or consistent checklist that they're following. They don't have a consistent way to review some of their past winners and losers, and especially their losers, really trying to learn from their mistakes and they don't have a great routine for having what I would call a market awareness, surveying the investment landscape and making sure you understand everything that's happening. Yeah. Um, so for me, having good daily, weekly routines in place, I think, are, are crucial. I find a lot of investors, for the sake of time, for the sake of their focus, they skip that. And I would argue it's it's the best use of your time, best way to prioritize is start, start that period uh, effectively with a good routine. Now, you prepared a great chart book, and I want to jump into it. But before we do, I just realized, like, you okay, you got an opportunity to work with Peter Lynch directly. And I didn't ask you, what was he like? Like, what was, what's, well, tell me about that experience of uh, what, 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 tell us a little bit about Peter. What, what was it, what was it like uh, presenting charts to him? And uh, first of all, did, did he accept technical analysis? Uh, was, he, was he open to this for his way of looking at investing? Sure. So, you know, I think at my time at Fidelity, we had about 70 to 75 portfolio managers that we worked with. Uh, and so, you know, some people use the team a great amount. Some people use the team a little less. And we, you know, we did not have a homogenous approach. It was very individualized depending on, uh, you know, where, where we could fit technical analysis into each person's uh, process. So with, you know, with Peter, he strikes me as a guy who was less of a technically oriented investor for sure, but very astute as a uh, market historian. And I, I found spending time with guys like Peter who had been managing money around, you know, the 1974 low, the 1982 low, the 1987 crash. Those were great historical periods to uh, to understand. And, you know, a lot of people don't think about, you know, 1982 to 83. But this is a period where coming out of a secular bear market phase in the you know late 60s to early 80s. Um, you know, 1983, the Dow finally broke above 1,000, which, you know, felt like it was never going to do. And so, you know, talking with guys like Peter about what that felt like and how you positioned yourself and how you thought about, uh, you know, uh, just sector rotation and asset allocation, all those sorts of things uh, was was fantastic. And I, I was super happy that a lot of the newer portfolio managers were able to lean on guys like Peter to, you know, to be better equipped to uh, to face the unknowable. Um, so it was fun. I, I think some of the portfolio managers, we I, I found a small handful, probably 10 of them, uh, used the group uh, heavily, meaning they would mm -hmm. rarely make a, a position change uh, without input from our team. And some would rarely, if ever, use the team. And that's about right. At a, at a shop like that, you needed to have a good distribution of how much they consumed uh, our, our team's work. How was his personality? Was he uh, more of a jokester or a very, very serious guy? How, how did he come across? <laughs> It, so, uh, boy, how to how to summarize it? I, you know, it was funny. Some of the best money managers, not necessarily Peter in particular, but I found some of the the best money managers just had a real quirkiness to them. I feel like the 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 most successful just had, were very quirky and very unique and very fascinating to talk to. Yeah. Um, Peter, you know, struck me as more of a business uh, oriented. I mean, he was very big. He would be able to recall statistics on fundamental data on a company from 30 years ago, um, you know, way more deeply than I could ever imagine. I think that's one of the reasons why he was so successful. So talking with him, it was a lot on the details and uh, and it was uh, it was fascinating working with guys like that, I think, was uh, was just humbling more than anything. That's awesome. All right. Well, listen, you put together a great chart deck. Let's uh, let's dive into this. But before we even get into, well, I guess the first chart shows it. But uh, what a shit show! Like, have you? I mean, living through. I, I don't. Were you in the markets in '87? No, 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 no. Oh. So that, either was know, I. That that tech sell off in in 2000, 2001 was my first introduction to a bear market phase. And so this, you know, it's funny, I, I was talking to one of my uh, friends, Dan Russo, who's at uh, Chaikin Analytics. I've known Dan for a number of years. He's a technical analyst and, and has worked with institutional investors for a number of years. And he and I were comparing notes. You know, a lot of people were, uh, when the market started selling off, they're looking back to that 2007 to 2009 period and immediately trying to draw some parallels between them. 
But for, for he and I, we, we both agreed, it reminded us a lot more about the 9-11 period in New York, which was, you know, sort of a non-financial issue that was manifesting itself in, you know, it was all about, in, in the data, it was all about how people were reacting to this unknowable, somewhat frightening event that was going on uh, and what it, how it, what it meant for companies and stocks and, you know, the economy was a, was a true unknown. And as a result, yeah. there was a lot of fear that was driving sales, a lot of panic selling. And that's a lot what the last couple of weeks have felt like to, to him and I, for sure. Well, there you go. So listen, yeah, you, the first chart you have here, uh, you're, we're looking at the uh, S&P 500 on the weekly charts. So what are we, what are we looking at? So, you know, for me, uh, looking at charts, it's all about market history. And so, you know, I do a, a daily market routine every morning. I call it my morning coffee routine. And this chart is the first chart I look at every day. And you might ask, why would you start every day with a long term weekly chart of the S&P? And the answer is I'm a long term investor. That's the, the time frame I'm tending to operate on. I'm trying to help people look three, six, 12 months down the road. And if that's my time frame, I need to look at the data that's going to help prime my thinking in that proper perspective. So, you know, this is basically looking at a long term uh, trend and it's the 21 and 34 week exponential moving averages. So it's a very long term trend following approach. And just below there is the PPO based on those two metrics. So it's the difference between the 21 and 34 week exponential moving averages based on the percents. So, you know, at this point, it has still been in bullish mode, even with the steep sell off that we've had. And that's sort of by design. This isn't meant to trigger very often. There are years where it doesn't trigger one way or the other. It's meant to just trigger after a, a severe change in trend. You may ask, haven't we had enough of a trend change? And you're right, down 30 percent certainly feels like it. What that long term trend, though, is is meant to prevent climactic loss, the 50, 60 percent moves that um, that could be coming. And so I, I think if we stay around here next week, we'd most likely trigger that sort of long term trend signal. Um, yeah. The bottom chart, the bottom panel there is the weekly PPO based on the traditional sort of MACD settings, 12 and 26 and nine. And that is more of the tactical read. And as you can see, that turned negative. Uh, about a month ago, so that first big sell off off of the uh, off of the highs that triggered. So for me, that's the tactical read that tells you to start to take risk off the table. The longer term trend is just trying to capture the big long term picture and and has not quite signaled a transition to more of a uh, you know secular secular bear phase. But uh, but boy, getting close to it. Now tell me if I'm wrong about my interpretation, but really to me the reason that we haven't seen the PPO turn negative is just the, the speed of which this has happened. When you're uh, taking you know 21 and 34 week moving averages, when you're only taking four samples of uh, four weeks of of price movement, the averages have not had a chance to react yet enough to actually uh, dump this in below zero. And, uh, and that's actually just a testament of how fast the sell-off actually happened. I mean, the indicators are not even able to, to, to start showing such negative uh, numbers. I, I wanted to, you did mention the MACD there, which is the, the, the PPO um, is the percentage price oscillator, which has uh, got a very similar um, uh, kind of profile to the MACD, right? But why do you prefer the PPO over, over the MACD itself? Yeah, so MACD is a pretty commonly used uh, technique uh, created by Gerald Apple, and and the idea was, uh, you know, looking at the difference between moving averages, which is something that most technical analysts kind of learn from the very beginning as a way to smooth out price data. The problem with MACD is it's not it doesn't make for easy comparisons across uh, stocks or asset classes because it's based on the actual price differences between you know over, over those time yeah. periods. The PPO does the same sort of analysis, but it's based on the percent instead of on the price. So it, it creates a much more consistent uh, sort of pattern and, and, and allows you to compare different stocks much more easily using the indicator. So the signals are, are basically identical. It's just the values make a little yeah. more sense. That's why, that's why I use it. So now on the next chart here, you again are looking at the S&P, but now uh, we're down to the daily chart. So uh, what are we looking at? So, you know, the trend, the tactical trend has been down. We know that and it's down. And, and you're right. Your comment about how quickly the, the, the difference or what's been different this time is how quickly we have gone down. So we've completely round tripped down to the December 2018 lows, as you can see on this chart. The fact that that 30 percent move happened in, you know, four to five weeks is what's so unusual. Usually in previous bear market phases, that's taken, you know, three to six months to do that sort of destruction. So the severity, the quickness of it is what's been so unusual. And just the fact that we've hit 
the, uh, the, the circuit breakers that we have so consistently over the last couple of weeks is sort of testament to that speed of the, of the decline. But I think now we've, you know, since that first initial move down, I looked at the chart and found two key levels, you know, two key areas. The first one was that sort of 2850 range, which was the lows from last summer, last August, and then last October. And that seemed like the first sort of key point of uh, to expect some support. So, you know, at the end of February, when we bounced off of that level, that felt like, okay, if this is just going to be a garden variety pullback, that's about where that would make sense. That sort of lines up technically. I could see that. But when we blew right down through that and then got right down through 2700, you immediately have to look at the previous market lows and, and bring in more and more data on the chart. And I find when I have to keep bringing in more historical data just to try to get a sense of where we're at, that tells you how deep the bear has gone. And the fact that now we're testing 2350, I think going into the next couple of weeks, I think that's a key level. Um, you know, this week we traded below it a number of times, but never really closed below it. And what you want is you want to close through the support level and then some sort of confirmation of follow through. Friday's close pushed us down below there. Finally, we almost got down to 2300 on a closing basis. So, yeah. you know, we've now broken down through that support. I think next week is when we know whether there's follow through and, and I think much further downside. But this, I think this chart also tells you that pr markets can correct in price and or time. There's two ways that it can do it. So we might sell off and chop around, just have a really volatile stretch. If you look at the last week, we really didn't go anywhere. We're sort of right where we were a week ago, but you know, it's just chopped around a ton uh, coming off of last Friday's, uh, you know, the move off of last uh, last Friday's lows. But um, you know, so I think there there also could be a time component that I think will be very frustrating for people. So now you specialize in behavior and uh, and psychology as well, and so I want to share a, a hypothesis that I have on why this happened so quickly. Is like this is this may arguably be the first kind of market crash where all participants are so interconnected through the internet. Uh, I mean, with the uh, the growth of uh, of the use of computers, and therefore everyone's a junior technical analyst in some degree or another, getting live quotes on their uh, on their machines in a, in, a, in a millisecond. Everyone is communicating with everyone else, and this can, uh, in some way, accelerate the process. Because when uh, someone yells "fire" and everyone's running for the exit door, you know you you have the CTAs that all hit the cell at the uh, similar levels when the price trend changes, and all of these little things, that feedback mechanisms, that basically almost uh, ensure that this thing happens more rapidly. Like, do you think that the fact that we are so interconnected socially through the internet and things like this, that this actually is contributing to the volatility? Really good question. Um, I would say that certainly seems part of it, right? So there's a, there's a uh, feedback loop that occurs now with social media. And so, you know, when things move, and you could argue with cryptocurrencies, maybe that's where we've seen it even, even accentuated where, you know, big moves will happen and they just send the, the volatility just tends to balloon up because so many people are reacting to similar things and they're able to come together uh, through social media to reinforce each other's uh, preconceived opinions. One, one of the worst things about social media is the more you use it, especially financial uh, social media, the more you use it and the more you like things on FinTwit type of uh, posts, the more that those are going to surface you. So you're very quickly refining your list of, uh, of friends um, to people that think and look at pretty similar to what you do. And the problem is you're just going to keep validating what you were already going to do already. So I would encourage and confirmation you to, bias, right? Exactly right. And so what I would encourage people to do is, is as much as you can proactively look for people that have a different investment thesis. If you're bearish right now, look for people that are screaming bulls and try to understand you're, you're going to have to look for them because they won't surface for you automatically, probably. But if you look for them, it's pretty interesting to see you know, what they're thinking. The other thing I would say that, you know, remember the, the challenge with big bear markets like this, they don't happen that often. They happen every, you know, 10 plus years or so. And the problem is it's been long enough that the market structure is going to be different. So the big difference I see right now, this is the first big bear market after the financial crisis, which means a lot of ETFs have been created and a lot of flows have all been to ETFs since, you know, over the last 10 plus years. And this is the first time those structures have been tested in this sort of environment. And we don't really know what that impact is, but I would say, you know, a lot of the moves down so suddenly feel not just as people are afraid, but it's also more forced selling. And if you think about it, ETFs having to unload shares, you know, to deal with flows and all of that could certainly put much more additional downside pressure than we would have seen otherwise. So I think 
how this plays out, I think that will be an opportunity for a lot of people to reflect on the structure of the ETFs and other products and how you know it, it was handled because we, we've never tested them in this sort of environment yet. We don't know. All right. Well, let, let's go on to the next chart because here you're showing the advanced decline lines uh, for the different markets. So what are you uh, what are you getting from this? What is this telling you? So I think a lot of people, and again, I think fellow technical analysts, it's so tempting to try and call a bottom. And if there's one thing I've learned over many years of seeing markets bottom and reverse, the, the most difficult thing you will ever be able to try to do is call a bottom as it's happening. <laughs> it is very easy to anticipate and just sort of guess when a bottom could happen. It's very, it's usually easy after the bottom has played out to confirm that that was because you have trend following tools that tell you the trend is positive. But, you know, it, it is very difficult to call it as it's happening. So for me, I'm looking for some signal of confirmation. When, when the market has done what it's done, I'm going to assume that the, the path of least resistance is lower. And I still think that's the case. I still think we have further down to go. So looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines as a way of analyzing breadth. And what had happened up until this market top in February was you can see the higher peaks in the top red line, which is the cumulative advanced decline for the S&P 500. If you look at the, all the other ones, which is the New York Stock Exchange, the mid cap space and the small cap space, they all actually put in a lower low in the February high. So the breadth was still positive for the large mega cap trade, but it was already sort of giving you a red flag all the way down the rest of the cap tiers. Now you have all of them going lower. And until I would see these lines turn positive, and this is a colorization that's subjectively determined by me as the analyst. So if I feel compelled to turn these more neutral and then turn them more positive green, that would tell me that the market has bottomed out. I see nothing on here telling me that, that the trend is anything but down at this point. All right. Well, let's go on to the next chart because here you're talking about the S&P and the uh, composites uh, new high lows. And so what is this telling? Again, it's pretty cr crazy because, I mean, we're, we haven't seen this here. Uh, anything like this in five years. Do, when you go even farther back, I mean, uh, are these extremes now even uh, more extreme than 2008 or not yet? So, and, that, and that's why I bring, bring this up. I think this is a trap that a lot of analysts, uh, you know, are, are running into. And I would, you know, again, anyone that's, you know, if you call yourself a millennial or anything younger than that, you really haven't been through one of these periods before, probably and in, in investing during the period. So, it's a challenging time. It's also a good opportunity to learn. But I find a lot of people struggle because if you're just looking back at the last couple of years, even the last five, 10 years, you are limiting yourself to a screaming bull market with notable exceptions, 2015, 2010, 11. You know, there are times when it wasn't as vertical as it was in like 2017, but overall, it's been a positive trend. And this is different. And so when the indicators you're looking at, in this case, the new lows, when they go materially lower, this is telling you at the worst, on the worst day in the last couple of weeks, 65% of the S&P was making a new 52 week low on the same day. I, you know, As you could probably guess, that's pretty unusual to have it be that extreme. You have yeah. to go back much further. So what you need to do is go back to the 2008, 2009 bear market, back to 2001, 2002, if you can't even further and see what these indicators did. To answer your question, the short answer is, this looks a lot like that 2008 to 2009 period. It doesn't look like the market bottom in 2009, though. It looks like the beginning. It looks like that impulse move, that first big move down. And then we had a nice sort of what felt like a bottoming rally before we had, and it sort of sucked a bunch of people in. Then we had that next leg down where people really puked out to lower lows. That's when, you know, and... My, my mentor, Walter Deemer, who was a technical analyst at Putnam in, in the 70s and 80s, always said, when the time comes to buy, you won't want to. And I, feel, I see people still too optimistic about buying the bottom. When, when things really puke out, it, it'll feel, you couldn't imagine buying. That's the time when, when you're going to want to do it. So, so let's, let's talk about that. And, you know, we'll, we'll go a little off on a tangent on this because rarely, I mean, it's not, I guess it's not impossible, rarely do bear markets end in three, four weeks. Uh, and um, they're, they're prolonged processes and with repetitive, like, you know, everyone looks at the S&P 500, uh, you know, decline of 50 plus percent in 2008, but it was actually three sequential drops of 30 plus percent that happened over, you know, uh, more than a year. It was like, what, 15 months or something like that. And it's just like, it kind of, 
and does a big puke to the downside, does a retrace, then it, then it kind of consolidates and then begins another leg lower. It's like a prolonged process of, uh, of kind of cleansing the system. And there are so many people that just see their favorite stocks on sale because, you know, I could buy, you know, Disney 40% or 30% lower than where it was uh, trading just uh, two weeks ago and or three weeks ago. And they're, they're, the emotional thing is I got to buy it. It's cheap. I got to get in now. Right. Yeah. But, uh, but this is a prolonged process. So how do you think that this is going to be an extended bear market? Like what, what's your intuition? I'm, uh, we're talking the David Keller uh, intu- intuition here. Is, is, is this a process? <laughs> Well, and again, I mean, the best thing we can do is look at market history. And 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 again, I what what's challenging right now is we've never had a sell off as quick as we've seen right now. Um, you know, in in in, in recent yeah. history, when anyone's been alive that I know. And so the problem is, this is certainly in, you know, pun intended, uncharted territory of, of a sort. But what is consistent is that uh, investor psychology, right? The human nature to it, and. That makes sense. If you look at major market bottoms, they have always been a process. Even just the the chart, you know, looking at the last five years, when you look at the low in 2016, when you look at the low in December of 2018, neither of those, and again, they were much shallower than what we saw recently, but both of them sort of had that initial sell-off where things got a little scary, then they recovered a little bit. And that's the consistent part about bottoms, that there are these reaction moves. Even last yeah. Friday, the market was up 9%, 10% when President Trump made his announcement. It sucks a lot of people in. And what they're thinking is you, you have this fear of missing the recovery, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell at the lows or I'm going to miss this chance to ride things back up. So you're desperate to get back in and, and not miss out on that beginning leg. But most bear markets, if not everyone I've ever been a part of, has a number of those uh, you know, whip back rallies, you call them a dead cap bounce, where you sort of bounce up off of lows, but you really don't want to be buying them. They're, they're a signal that the market almost has further to go. Um, what you're looking for is more of a, you know, pattern of higher lows, a pattern of accumulation, seeing that buying is coming in, that the that the uh, selling uh, pressure has alleviated. And, and again, you've not seen that. I, I also would say, though, depending on what you're thinking, I mean, if you're retiring 30 years down the road, I think it's totally justifiable to be buying, you know, stocks when they're at a discount, which, you know, you're, you're buying things for 30 percent off right now. If you're retiring 30 years down the note, I don't think I can't imagine you would feel bad about by having bought stocks right about here. But again, there are career busting moves over the next 30 years that, you know, if that's not your time frame. You have to be a little more tactical, a little more thoughtful about it. And I, I, as you mentioned, I think bottoms are a process and I, I, I can only assume it's going to take longer than what we've seen so far to, to declare any sort of bottom being in place. So, so Dave, you, you, you got me, uh, uh, w- wanting to rant a little bit and I want you to kind of validate or, or argue back on, on this point. But one of the biggest uh, mistakes I feel investors do is they get in the trap of looking at percentage returns a- as their measure. So you were talking about the nine, 10% up day on Friday, uh, mm. but I, I like, I, I kind of put it in the context. So like, uh, let's say crude oil. So crude oil in, in a span of a month wipes out from like 55 bucks down to 20 right Mm -hmm. and so it's like a 60 plus percent decline in oil just carnage right but uh, you could then that's a 60 percent decline but off of the 20 dollar low a rally back to $30 is a 50% rise. And so somebody that is looking uh, at this from a percentage perspective saying, holy cow, oil's up 50% off of the lows. I mean, it's not even going to be halfway up of undoing the losses, yet it's on a 50% gain. So what happens is a lot of investors in the media love to talk about percentages, but it's incredibly deceptive uh, because because the percentage on the way down versus the percentage on the way up flip, especially when they have this kind of volatility and this magnitude of swings, right? So you're absolutely right. And I think one of the worst things that you can do as an investor, regardless of your time frame, is pay too much attention to you know intraday percent moves in anything. Um, It's a great way to understand what's happened, but that shouldn't be a main input in your decision. And that's why I think charts can be so valuable. If you look at what happened last Friday, stocks were up 9 to 10%, and it was easy to feel really good about things because of that move. But if you look, we still were way below where we'd been not too long before that and and still- Oh, it it didn't even, it didn't even make a higher high above the previous day's candle. Like it, 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 like it was, it wasn't even significant technically. 
No. And so I think there, I think that uh, speaks to the value of longer term charts. Again, we're going back to that very first chart we looked at was a weekly chart of the S&P. There's a reason why that chart can be so helpful. That gets rid of the flickering ticks, the noise of the short term movements. And it's just trying to understand the long term trend. And I find if you're a longer term investor, even if you're a shorter term investor, you should be starting with that sort of reference. That's your time frame. Looking yeah. at short term percent moves should be at the very end of your process, if at all. And if I would argue all. for a lot of investors, the best thing you could do is not look at the markets Friday to Friday and just every Friday fire things up, do your analysis, make the changes you need, and then do something else for the next five days. And and, and you're going to be better off because you won't you won't be caught up in the emotional drivers of uh, of day to day movements right now. Right. So let, let's go on because uh, otherwise we're going to uh, take forever here. <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 you, you get me triggered here. Anyway, so uh, let's let's move on. Uh, so this chart over here, you have um, uh, the uh, 200 day and the 50 day moving averages. Uh, what are you uh, trying to show here? Yeah. So I, I think one of the things and again, I, I mean, I'm not to pat myself on the back. I, I mean, this certainly has felt pretty negative very quickly. I, you know, I've told Chip Anderson, who, who, uh, who founded Stock Charts and hired me and moved, helped move me out here to Redmond, Washington. You know, we're in Seattle, so we, we're, it feels like we're a week or two ahead with all the coronavirus developments. And so things have felt you know, worse and worse here. While I saw people I talked to in other parts of the country did not sort of recognize the severity of what was going on. And so that was happening as this indicator, the breadth of the, of the S&P stocks above their 200-day broke below 50%. And if you look back over the last five years, the time when the times when that's held the 50 percent line have been viable pullbacks within the overall uptrend. The market in each of those times rarely broke below the 200 day very much. Um, they were sort of the viable move. Uh, even the beginning of 2018, you know, didn't hit the break through the 200 day. You stayed above 50 percent, looked pretty good. The three times now that that's happened has led to much steeper or further declines. And so you know, lining it back up with the previous chart, looking at new lows, the, the, the breadth picture is what turns so negative, even before the market sold off 30%, when it's selling off five to 10%, but that breadth reading showing you how it related to previous steeper sell-offs is what started to concern me. And now if you look back to the 2008, 2009 period, that percent of stocks above their 200, that can re remain below 10% for extended periods of time. And Back then, I think that first push down, it probably was four to six months when it remained that low because things were so beaten down. And I think that's sort of what we're looking at here. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move on and, and actually check out this AAA, sorry, AAII bull bear uh, spread. So, so you, we're talking about the American Association of Individual Investors that puts out those bull bear sentiment, right? And so is, you're, you're charting this. So what, what are we looking at? How severe is this? So, you know, it's interesting. If you look at last week, this is a, a, the individual investors. It's a weekly survey comes out every Thursday afternoon. Um, and, and are you, you know, the question is, are you bullish, bearish or neutral on, on stocks? And what happened last week was a, you had a huge uh, flip lower. So, you know, it, it, people had remained kind of even between bulls and bears. That's where that, uh, you know, that difference at the bottom is almost flat to zero. But then last week it really came down significantly. It was one of the biggest moves in that uh, in that ratio in a long in a long time, and it showed you how uh, how how negative people had gotten so quickly. What's even more telling is if you look at the top panel there, or the, the the next panel down, which is the percent of bears, which are the bars in red. It got below fifty yeah. percent, which is actually it's pretty a rare. It's rare that over half of respondents are are bearish on the market. In the historical bear market phases, deeper bear markets like I would argue we're in, that will get below 50 percent and remain below 50 percent for extended periods of time. Looking back at the last five years, you've seen it maybe get down there for a week or two and then come right back up. I think if that remains lower, it just shows you how negative people are and how consistently negative that they remain on stock. And, and it's amazing because the coronavirus adds a psychological um, uh, element that is beyond the price of the and the sentiment uh, on the charts themselves. It's it's about the fact that people are going to see other people around them getting sick and those headlines and all of this. And it really is going to uh, potentially be an outside contributor to that negativity because people are going to have a hard time imagining the stock market rallying in a period when this, things seem to be getting worse on the surface, right? That's exactly right. And I, I think it's less less the news flow and more the uncertainty. I think uncertainty, people don't tend to buy stocks in a period of uncertainty. They tend to go to safe havens because they don't know what's yeah. going to happen. There's a time I've seen when it's just uncertain. It's right now. Yeah. And, and 
the problem is is that it, the only safe haven now is U.S. dollars. <laughs> it's, it, it, like it, it doesn't matter what else. Everything else is being murdered. I mean, even bonds have had a, a week or two of selling now. It's uh, nowhere to hide but USD, right? That's exactly right. If you look at asset allocation, there, there are very few places that are actually moving materially or higher. And, and the dollar is one of the few things that's consistently been able to do that. Yeah. And so here you have the uh, consumer discretionary versus staples. Uh, what are you picking up here? Yeah. So we can move quickly through these. I have a series of ratios that I use to try to just understand the next level down, you know, key key relationships that I think are, are important to, to look at. You know, what we saw here leading up to the market top in February, if you look at the consumer space, I always like to look at are people more on the offensive side of consumer discretionary, more the defensive side of consumer staples. And well before this market really sold off, you saw this ratio going lower. The top panel is looking at the XLY and the XLP, which are you know the, the, the commonly used sector ETFs, but they're cap weighted. So something like the XLY has a huge overweight in Amazon, basically. It's over a quarter of the, of the, of the ETF. The bottom panel is using two equal weighted ETFs for consumer discretionary and consumer staples. So if you look, you know, even leading up to, you know, beginning of the year, that sort of was the peak. And it's been in a downtrend since yeah. January, uh, showing that within consumer that institutions were rotating more than a defensive side of that. And I, I still see that in the bottom panel uh, continuing. Right. And how about uh, the semiconductors versus the S&P? I'm shocked, actually, the semis haven't broken uh, in a bigger way. So I, I am shocked as well. And this has been one of my, my favorite uh, sort of bull market gauges, because when semiconductors are doing well, the market tends to be doing well. Um, it's rare. You know, they tend to outperform in bull market phases, underperform in bear market phases. It's not happened this time. And this may be the first time that it's become this disconnected. Semiconductors have actually held in there just fine. Now, they're obviously coming down, but coming down in line with the market. Um, you know, it, it. I think it speaks to tech and you know if you look at the xlk it's probably the best relative performer of any of the sectors if you look at the long-term trend and it's stocks like apple and others that have that have just been consistent strong performers during the bull phase and also during the bear phase um so i think technology has become a safe haven in a way that it hasn't been in previous cycles and i think this chart more than anything sort of uh clarifies that yeah and so so next one here you have the momentum relative strength and uh, so what what are we seeing here so with, you know, there are a number of factor ETFs we can use just to understand what's driving, what's leading. The fact that the momentum factor has done so well in the last, you know, year to date, uh, up until the last uh, couple of weeks basically tells you, you know, this is this is buying stocks that have worked. What, what this is telling you in the last couple of weeks is there is a bit of an inflection. Momentum is actually coming down as a factor. What that tells you is we're in a period of rotation. And so, you know, we're seeing big percent yeah. swings that are going to cause this ratio to fluctuate. I think I'm looking for this to stabilize more to get a sense of whether we're rotating into the beaten down names, things like energy and others that, you know, argue, you know, potentially are coming up, but, but boy, coming from a very beaten down uh, place. Right. Like Marco Kolonovic over there at uh, JP Morgan, the head uh, macro strategist there, he, uh, he's he been making a call for almost a year about the rotation from momentum to value. And and it, it's been spectacularly early. I won't say wrong, but early. In, in, in this industry, we, we're, we're never wrong. We're just early, right? And uh, and. And and but uh, but it, you know it's the momentum trade has just been what worked. But you know what? One of the drivers in my mind, from a macro perspective, is the fact that share buybacks were so aggressively being used by the the stocks are are classified as the top momentum stocks. And with the credit markets breaking here in the last couple of weeks, um, their access uh, to the the credit markets to borrow money to do their share buybacks, or even their appetite in this uncertainty. To, uh, to spend their cash reserves buying back stock uh, may um, contribute to, to this rotation. It'll be really interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, but uh, on the next chart, though, uh, you can also comment on that, but uh, next chart, we also have the small caps versus large caps. So why don't you uh, comment on that and then take us into the next chart? Right. So I think in the terms of momentum, I, you know, it can be really instructive to look at what is in the momentum uh, factor, what's in the momentum factor ETF, because it rotates a good deal, actually. So, you know, based on what's happening, things like biotechs might would be in there, um, you know, things that you might not expect. Sometimes Pfizer or something would be in there and, and be classified as a momentum name because it's had strong relative performance. So it can be interesting, actually, it can be instructive to see what's in that ETF because the, the holdings will change. And it basically is, is ranking what, you know, it's owning the stocks that have done 
done the best leading up to uh, to the to the rebalance period. Um, you know, this next yeah. chart, looking at small versus large, it's only to illustrate that I think you know it's been a mega cap driven market for a while now, and the sell off has not changed that picture at all. Um, you know, owning small caps has been a losing proposition. I don't see that changing based on just the leadership of what's happening. When when you start to see this ratio go higher, which we have just not in in a year plus, that would tell you that the configuration of the market is is changing to the point that you want to go get down the cap tiers, look for speculative picks in the small cap space. But I, I don't see anything here telling me to, to do that yet. Right. The, the next chart so the, is looking at growth yeah. value there. Yeah, and that's exactly what we were talking about. Well, we were talking momentum value, but it's it's a similar thing. But that this has just been screaming, right? So this chart and the next chart, this one's looking at growth versus value. The next one's looking at pure growth and pure value. So it tries to just clarify those two universes a little more. Both of them tell the same story that that sort of rotation to value that I've heard people talking about as well. But that's just it's just not happened. Uh, now, again, I mean, if you look at what's been leading, it's sort of big tech and those are going to be in the in the growth bucket for the most part. So the growthy names have become defensive here. It's it's not, you know, people looking for the traditional value space uh, yet. And again, the reason why I keep looking at these ratios is for some signal that that pattern is changing. But, you know, again, I think a lot of investors fall into the trap of value should work, quote unquote, because of X, Y, Z. The charts like this tell you what actually is working, and I would much rather bet on that as a as a process rather than what what should. You don't want to should all over yeah. yourself uh, in yeah. this sort of environment. What's What's interesting is uh, I never took the time to actually go back to the last bear market to actually see how value did relative to growth. Did you Do you know off the top of your head uh, how how this uh, pattern played out throughout two thousand eight? Or yeah. And, and- Right. I was going to say the challenge with this is it's this is very different because again you've had the differences what's led into the you know the market sell off and it's been this mega cap sort of you know the whole yeah. fang trade and then it's the you know the mega cap uh, tech consumer communication services names sort of an unusual pattern that's not really been the leadership in a lot of the previous cycles as much and, and not as not as narrowly focused potentially with a with the narrowing breadth that we've seen. Um, so yeah, traditionally value comes into favor and, and it starts to be an opportunity to buy, you know, great companies at a bargain, but it's again, just not seeing it yet. Yeah. So on the next chart here, you got the high beta versus low vol. And I'm, I'm obviously uh, leading up to January into February, like sectors like REITs and, and utils have all were screaming higher and it influenced uh, this type of a, a ratio, but that flipped pretty quickly, didn't it? Totally true. And again, I, I think, you know, what's surprising to me or what has been fascinating to me are, are things like utilities and real estate, some of the more defensive sectors that you would think of as, you know, sort of the the defense that people would not want to be in. They've been some of the better relative performers in certain time periods. That's actually not that unusual. And and that this ratio is OK as a as a sort of a, a, a proxy for that. But if you look at individual sectors, there's usually a lot of stories below there. I think with use in real estate, you get a uh, you know a, a need for yield, a need for income, and both of those obviously have a pretty healthy dividend component. Um, so I think that's part of the story here with ultra low interest rates; those are providing some some good total return opportunities. But even back, if you look at like 2014, which was sort of the middle of that sort of big secular bull market cycle, the number one sector in the S and P or in the S and P in 2014 was utilities. So during a bull market phase at a time when you'd expect the juice to be leading, it was utilities that led on a total return basis. So there are always sector themes that are there. This is for me, this chart more than anything is a reminder to look not at what should lead, but what has been leading. Look at the charts, look at the rotation. And again, if you in general own what's working and and don't own what has not been working, you're going to finish out uh, pretty well. Right. And so on the next chart, you're looking at the S&P 500 uh, versus the world, right? Like just and it, the U.S. has been an outperformer for uh, for a long time. And even even during the slam, like the euro stock was down like 40 percent. Like so when you're you're talking about some of the global markets, it, while the S&P is getting killed, some of these other markets are, are just uh, are just slamming that much worse. Right. And uh, what, what's what do you think this trend continues? Certainly, certainly seems to be, and, I, and this speaks to the dollar strength. I mean, this this certainly you know speaks to the fact that the dollar is going up. How it is, this ratio is most likely going to continue in this in this direction. And it what it tells you two things. I think number one, it tells you as a U.S. based investor, it pays to stay close to home still until this ratio changes. 
But for me, I'm always looking for themes that I think are underrepresented or, or things that people are underprepared for. I would say most people have gotten used to the fact that the U.S. stocks have been outperforming. At some point, that trend's going to reverse. And I think what this chart tells me is that people will be very unprepared for it. So I'm watching it to see when we get a reversal. And when this starts turning lower and non-U.S. markets start to outperform, I want to be aware of that and I want to be there. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and here, uh, next chart, you're talking about merging markets versus developed markets. Uh, you, uh, what's, your, what's your take? Is that reversal significant enough? So, it, you know, it, it's an interesting chart and actually is still leaning with a lot of volatility. It's still leaning now towards EM over developed markets. And again, there are a lot of stories that are making this chart do what they're doing. I mean, this is the coronavirus story. It's also oil prices because uh, there are a lot of emerging markets with ties to, uh, to commodities and, and so forth. Uh, but overall, the trend has been leaning more towards emerging markets, uh, even with the steep sell off in oil, even with some of those markets struggling, even with China having a lot of challenges. Obviously, overall, it's paid more to be on the EM side than uh, than developed Europe and Asia, basically. So that ratio, I think that's actually uh, surprising to see. I would expect EM yeah. to be severely underperforming. It's actually holding up not too bad right now. Yeah, no, I agree with that completely. And so here you're talking about stocks versus bonds, and and uh, obviously they've often been inversely correlated. Last couple of weeks, we're seeing divergence where they're both actually selling simultaneously, treasuries and the markets. But uh, what uh, what uh, what are you taking away from this? So you know, the, you know, looking at the lower peak in this ratio, and this is looking at just the spiders versus the TLT. So stock prices versus bond prices, and if you look since mid-February, put in a, a lower high there, and then it's just been a, in a significant downtrend. So mid-February, when this, this ratio breaks down, tells you if you're not leaning towards bonds and some sort of asset allocation, you're potentially missing the boat. And even with both of them moving uh, together, right? So in February, you had them both going up together. Recently, you've had them both going down together at times. Today, they sort of fanned out a little bit and bonds rallied pretty good. But overall, this has continued to, to tilt more towards the fixed income side. And I think that trend and being aware of the strength that we've seen, relatively speaking, from bonds is, is a theme that I think people have uh, have been a little scared to uh, to pay attention to that I think is, is, is very much still in play. You know, bonds uh, have done so well, largely because of the convexity at the tail end of these yield moves that has just driven this. But, but the interesting part psychologically, when you see the 10-year yield hit spot 36 on yield, and, and like unless you um, are mentally prepared to see a negative yield in the United States, on, a, on at least in the middle of the curve, not necessarily uh, the Fed pushing negative, but unless you have this, it's hard to... Uh, continue to press bonds here uh, for further gains just because of the lower bound of zero, assuming lower bound of zero is actually the lower bound. But, well, uh, but that, it, that brings up a good point. And, I, and, and I'll tell you a story just from the last couple of weeks when the 10 year yield sort of hits 1%. I remember tweeting out, you know, listen, yields are breaking down. You know, I, I, and, and I was probably looking at the TLT at the time. I, you know, bond prices look good. I think this is going to continue. And someone responded to me and said, but hold on a second. We're at you know all time lows for for yield. How could how could it go lower? And you made they made they made the crucial mistake, which is don't confuse the bottom of the page with support. Just because something's lower than it's been <laughs> for a long time does not mean it can't go materially lower. So looking at this ratio, you could have said at the beginning of March, well, yeah, but the ratio is the lowest it's been for the last year. That doesn't mean it can't keep going lower a lot longer. And there are a lot of reasons why it couldn't or shouldn't. But if that's what's happening, that's what's going to happen. Now, theoretically, you're right. You have a you have a bottom in yields, but I, again, I think bonds can still go up more than they have than they are right now. Uh, and and later we will figure out how that played out and why it was the case. But it's very easy right now to think too much about range bound things that are not range bound. We're just kind of wired to think that way for good reason. Right. And, you know, it's amazing that just to your point is like a lot of uh, and bear markets do this to investors. And this is like a warning to all those that are, are never experienced a bear market. But when you see a stock go from 20 bucks down to five and you're like, man, this thing's down 75 percent. It's a no brainer to buy it. When the thing goes from five down to three and you bought it at five, you're still down you know, 40 uh, percent. And. Uh, and it's 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 hard because you see it go from twenty to five, and you mentally say, "My God, that's cheap." But yeah. it, but but that 
five, move from five to three is still 40%. It's emotionally still as devastating, even though you got a $15 lower than its peak price. And it's so hard to, to, to fade that uh, until you actually see an established bottom you can trade against, right? That is exactly right. And again, I think the trap a lot of people will be following in and falling into here and I think will continue to as this bottoming process of always get very sucked into sort of the falling knife. And, and again, the, you know, just because stocks have gone down a lot doesn't mean they can't continue to go down a lot further. Yeah, it is. So anyway, you got your very, very long term chart on the S&P to, uh, to close this off. And uh, what is this telling you, bud? So, I mean, more than anything, I mean, this is you know, my career started about midway through this chart in 2000. And this is, for me, it's just a way to finish off the, the discussion by just reminding everyone that bull market and bear market phases have happened. Uh, they've happened uh, historically. The <laughs> two things that I will tell you that, that are always the case. Number one, all bear markets have been followed by a bull market. <laughs> to, and, I, and I don't yeah. see that changing. So the good news is, again, if you have a longer enough time horizon, uh, you know, I think I think there are there will be great opportunities that you will not see again to you know buy stock. That fear will drive stocks way further down than they probably deserve to be, and there will be a time when you should feel pretty confident backing buying up the truck. Long. You yeah, back up the right. truck and load uh, load Just up everything again. Okay. But that, but that, that's the sixty four thousand dollar question is to is when when do you back up that truck? And that's uh, that's going to be the the tricky part, isn't it? It is. And I think that, that my, my second point would just be, you know, the best thing I think you can do is look back at market history. A lot of us have learned to invest during a relatively uh, tame bull market phase. And these these periods, I you know, if I look back at my career, I've gone through the 2000 to 2002 bear market, the 2007 to nine um, were, were the two that I've really gone through. But I've spent a lot of time talking with, you know, uh, mentors that have invested in the you know 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and have gone through a lot of other ones. And you know, I will tell you that that the people that I know and, and also myself, they've learned, they've grown as an investor much more during these periods than during when everything's fine yeah. in the market phase. So I think there's more of an opportunity to learn and grow as an investor than ever. I think the best thing you can do is look at market history and, and see what you can learn. All right. Well, Dave, we're going to have to go on with the rest of the show. I can't thank you enough for being on here. But before we let you go, uh, you know, all, all of our listeners that uh, want uh, to see more from you or learn more about you or follow you or subscribe to your stuff, where can they find you? Yeah, thanks so much. This was a, a pleasure, Pat. I, I, I love what you guys do with the show. And I'm, I'm, I'm certainly happy to, to share anything I can help help people along uh, their journeys. Um, three ways I would suggest. So I'm the chief market strategist at stockcharts.com. So I, I host our daily closing bell show called The Final Bar. Um, it shows uh, after the close every day on, uh, on Stock Charts TV and also on our YouTube channel. Um, second thing is my website is called Market Misbehavior. So if you want to think more about how you think as an investor, that's a great place to get some of my guidance on uh, how to do so. And then on Twitter at DKellerCMT, um, give me a follow and I look forward to collaborating with, uh, with your friends there. Yeah, and uh, I, you invited me to, onto your show, so I look forward to uh, to shooting the shit about the markets with you next week. Will be a pleasure to have you on, my friend. Yeah, next week should be great. Well, uh, thank you very much, David, and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. It's a pleasure. Be safe. Good luck to all of you guys. Thanks. The sponsor of this week's market huddle is Coifin. Coifin is a new platform that gives you professional grade data and tools to analyze stocks and understand macro trends. It's a personal Bloomberg terminal for those who don't have $25,000 a year to spend on a Bloomberg. The best part, it's completely free. Go to koifin.com today. That's K-O-Y-F-I-N.com. Time for the rest of the show. Lena, hop on. Hello. Hey, so there's no beer sponsor this week, right? No, unfortunately there isn't. We're all... Well, and I, it is my fault because I, I'm a little bit of a strict... Uh, disciplinarian when it comes to drinking during midday you and know we are recording all, in the middle afternoon that's right we're recording at lunchtime and we are professionals after all patrick oh very much very much <laughs> so you, there's you, no but, drinking but, no drinking midday so we decided to put off our sponsor how about you um, lena um i'm having a quarantini <laughs> <laughs> that's it's not alcohol it's sparkling water uh watermelon flavored sparkling water 
Oh, there you nice. go. Nice. <laughs> I All like right. it. All right, Lena Kevin, needs do a drink. Just... <laughs> Lena needs a drink to get through this with us. That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. Side effects of too much huddle may include an uncontrollable urge to gamble with coworkers on financial asset prices, with the stakes being, of course, stakes. <laughs> Sudden desire to practice dark art technical analysis magic, and of course, Corona continuation crisis fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I'm suffering from that for sure. All right, <laughs> let's uh, let's get to talking some charts, Kev. Yeah, my favorite part. Let's do it. Uh, what oh. do you got for us? This well, week? actually, first of all, uh, this is brought to us by uh, Koifin, and we just uh, got to give a, a quick shout out. Uh, that platform is awesome. It's, it is terrific. Know. It's uh, you know, and uh, I, I'm of the belief that things are getting a little quieter, and uh, people might have a little more time at home these days. Make sure you take that time to go check it out and uh, go to koifin.com, k-o-y-f-i-n.com, and uh, see all the different uh, kind of fundamental and technical analysis that he has on that system. There you go. So let's jump right to those charts. And uh, what I wanted to do is uh, uh, here I, I just uh, put together uh, some charts on uh, a uh, monitor list here on the dashboard. And I wanted to just uh, touch on uh, what's going on in uh, the, uh, the currency markets. I mean, they've been buzzing, right? Yes, of course. It's been uh, U.S. dollars been on fire. Oh, it's been it's been an extraordinary move. And but what to me though, what's interesting is is that the Dixie, which is the dollar index, doesn't tell the whole story because it's so heavily weighted into the three major currencies of the euro, the pound, and uh, the Japanese yen. That um, that it, it when those currencies aren't moving, then it doesn't look like the dollar index is moving a lot. But this is where I wanted to kind of go to the periphery, really kind of understand the dollar rally by looking at some of the emerging markets and other developed nations that don't weigh so heavily in that index. So let, actually, let's just start off with looking at some of the developed markets like Australia and Canada. Uh, so look at the uh, Australian dollar. It hit 55 cents. Yeah, Is, it, it's isn't that brutal. absolutely crazy? It went from 66 cents to 55 cents in two weeks. Yeah, it's on par though for uh, for, for a lot of the other ones. Well, yeah, but not only that's on par for what's happening in the world. It's we're going through a deflationary collapse, and uh, yeah. commodity producers are being some of the worst hit. Right, and so, uh, but it, uh, when you go to New Zealand, you can see uh, the the New Zealand dollar has also been hammered from like sixty four cents down to fifty five, and then you look what happened to the uh, our Canadian dollar. Uh, it also went from a 76 cent level all the way to 68 cents in just one fluid motion like that. And so a lot of these commodity driven currencies are just getting hammered. I mean, these, this, uh, this is an outright U.S. dollar bull market breakout against all of these uh, kind of uh, commodity based currencies, right? Yeah, I would be careful about saying that it's a breakout that's going to last because I would consider this more of a squeeze it's basically a funding squeeze in terms of the amount of dollar U.S. dollars going around is limited, and not only that, it's kind of reverberating in in a self fulfilling uh, feedback loop, and you know, maybe it gets worse. Was, but but to, to me, a lot of these these commodity currencies are just screaming like that that this is. Uh, the obscene moment, the the scary prices yep. that, that I. That, but uh, I think that uh, it still has more to go. It's it's sort of like. Uh, when you were kind of talking about Tesla at 450 and it still went to like 800. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so eventually you're, it's going to lead to the blow off. And I think that w when the dollar reaches its top peak price, it will actually be a major turning point on a macro scale. Uh, but it's I, I'm just thinking that it's a little early to already say that, that this is enough. I think there's a more room for this to keep screaming, but I think that if you don't take advantage of this when it's, uh, when it's in the la later stages, when it reaches like the eighth, ninth inning, it's going to be one of the most important decisions all of our listeners can do is to make a big currency change, whether it's in your account or take advantage of it and lock it in because it's, it's, it's going to be an extraordinary move and it probably will rebound the other way in an extraordinary move the other way as well, right? Yeah, so it, it's feeling like that. Uh, what's the line we always say about uh, uh, Jimmy Rogers? And he talks about gold, and he says, "I, 
I shorted gold only two days before the high. Unfortunately, it was three hundred dollars early or something, and this was when gold yeah. went from five hundred to eight hundred. Yeah. Very well, could be right, Patrick, that uh, this is going to get a lot worse. As usual, I'm probably early. Uh, yeah. I don't deny that one. Bit, you are, but, you uh, are, but that's okay. But it's it's uh, it's a difficult to, for me to think about, you know, betting on this continuing. And I know Brent and his milkshake pals are all over this, but. Uh, it, it, it really feels to me that the Fed's providing a lot of liquidity, and I think that uh, we might be surprised yeah. it, that it bounces. But that's what makes the market. See. Well, it's interesting. I wanted to talk about um, uh, the um, Norwegian and, uh, Karun and uh, the Swedish Karuna as well because you know, the euro has been moving. But, like, look at this drop in um, the uh, Okay, one Norwegian. second. I got to interrupt you here, Patrick. Did you call it the Swedish Karuna? I think you did. <laughs> yeah, Corona. Is, is that how you say it? Isn't it the yeah. cro? Isn't it the Corona? Well, it depends on if you want to. It use. sounded like it sounded like you were making it Hawaiian. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> anyway, whatever the pronunciation is, let's look at the chart and uh, okay. and, and and so. But it's just what a what a drop, right? Like, I mean, obviously, it's going to um, be uh, impacted um, by uh, oil, right? And and so what 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 a crazy drop even, um, like look at look at these moves isn't that crazy? It, it's it's nuts. Like the, we're we're seeing dramatic uh, moves in it. Like what was the Swedish one? Let's go back to that one for a second. This, or, is, no, this sorry, is the, the Swedish one. Yeah, the Norwegian one. Let's have a look at that because yeah. that move is from eleven to down to eight. Yeah. So that's a thirty plus percent or almost a yeah. thirty percent move in, yeah. in two weeks. It's it's dramatic it's it's scary it's life-changing for all these countries it's destabilizing for the and whole financial much. system and that's the one thing that everyone needs to remember it's one thing when these things when the moves like that happen over the course of a year and even then it's difficult for companies to adjust yeah. this is happening in the course of a week right and this is the problem with the market right now is that the, nobody can deal with these sorts of the speeds of these moves absolutely and so i want to talk to talk about the uh, russian ruble and like as well, just a, an extraordinary drop. You know, it was at uh, spot one. Well, here it was. Yeah, it was about spot zero one six five, and it, it dropped all the way to uh, spot zero uh, one two one, and uh, j- just a, a, an extraordinary drop in the ruble. Uh, you then talk, uh, talk about Brazil. And you can see, like, in, in, talking to some of these emerging markets, uh, Brazil dropping from 25 down to 19. Uh, you, talk, uh, you take the South African rand uh, going uh, at this state. Yeah, it was trading at spot uh, 0717, goes all the way down to, uh, like, spot 0573. Like, it, just, like these are like 20, 30, 40% drops, like uh, right across the board. So the point I wanted to get across with these charts was just that, that you know, the euro and the, the Japanese yen have not made these uh, ridiculously huge moves. They moved big, but they, they didn't really leave their ranges that much. And it kind of gives this idea that the dollar index is only breaking two handles above its uh, uh, previous high. But when you go to these other currencies, we're talking 20, 30, 40 percent moves, right? It's crazy. Right. And that, that's a great point, Patrick, is that be careful when you're looking at just a narrow index like that and broaden your scope. Go look at all the emerging markets. And even, uh, you know, I don't even know what you consider some of these. They're not even emerging. They're just non-Dixie markets. Yeah. And uh, it, it, is, it is kind of very destabilizing all these people have debt in u.s dollars and this debt just became very much more expensive right now i i actually am going to save the oil chart for uh, when we get to um, the top three things to watch but i wanted to look at gasoline i thought this was just crazy i mean we went uh, from a, a level of um, 167 down to a low of 62 cents i guess that's what happens when no one drives <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like that's you know, like, like let's face it, everyone is sitting at home. There's no driving going on, and, and and you know, gasoline doesn't store. It's not like crude oil, right? Um, so the reality is that it, it could as, as crazy as that is. You know, who knows? Maybe it even goes lower. I don't know. Usually, usually well, I'm one you, to say that you should fade this, but I, I'm not so sure on this one. 
It's crazy. And another another chart that I thought was really interesting was the the finally the big breakdown in copper. You know, one of the things that I I was always arguing was that uh, I am I remain very bullish copper over the long term. I mean, we we had Johnny in uh, on the show, and really I I buy into that argument that copper is gonna uh, there's a room for a huge bull market. But obviously, with something like this and a global recession underway, it gets hammered first. But I didn't think we would see the it go below two and here we are like i mean at least on an intraday basis it printed below there uh, yeah and uh that one morning I, or i was looking at it no it wasn't even the morning it was late at night it opened in europe and they took it from 215 down to that like 195 handle in one crazy day and it was from yeah. asian selling i noticed that uh, why don't you tell me, like, is that a flying dodgy wedge or something like that? What is that big <laughs> candle there? Well, it's just a large shadow, so it's like a doji candle. Yeah, it's a, it's a uh, is that, uh, often is... often it's associated with uh, a swing low. It doesn't have to be the ultimate low, but it but it certainly is marking uh, the bounce or the retracement. And so you know, it's... copper can easily get back to like uh, two and a quarter on a bounce, uh, and uh, but then it it'll probably go back and retest the low or, or something. But it it definitely is a reversal pattern down there. Oh, that's good to know. So, As, what is that again? So I can put that into my repertoire. Uh, just a just a long shadow do doji. Long shadow doji. There you go. Well, you it's it a doji, but but it's just it's got a long wick at the bottom, which is basically marking a huge reversal that happened in nice. Today, right. I love it. Yeah. I love yeah. it. I don't have a clue what it means, but I like it. Uh, anyway, so uh, what I'm uh, well, well, actually, we'll talk more gold uh, later on in the top three. But what I wanted to just touch on was silver, and what was crazy about the silver move is it blew through all the 2016, uh, 15, 14 lows, right? Hold on, let me just put it on like a 10-year chart. Uh, but it, it's just crazy. There's right? no like, bid. Well, it's become an industrial metal at this point, Patrick. And that's yeah. the problem. Even gold is struggling, but uh, at least gold's hanging in there as as kind of a, a currency and, and uh, I guess, a hedge against the coming printing and so people are buying that what's interesting to me is the fact that it's if you look at the gold silver ratio it blew out to yeah, all time out. highs all yeah. time highs we've yeah. never seen this before so yeah. does that mean silver's a buy down here i don't know i i, I, I don't I, I i've never been uh, i never subscribed to the view that the the gold silver ratio was a market timing tool uh, you know what? I, I feel that generally what happens, uh, and maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but uh, generally what happens is gold takes off first. And then when everyone misses the gold move, then they start chasing silver as its little cousin. And inevitably, when there's a screaming bull market in gold, and eventually everyone piles into silver. And when it, do it starts to relatively outperform, suddenly everyone kind of piles into that market and then it has its face ripping rallies afterwards. But it's, it always seems to have a lag. And using the ratio as your... Uh, as your kind of tool for market timing it, I don't know if there's any value in that. I personally have never, I've never tried to make a decision on that anyway. I think that in the old days when you, people used to buy coins and stuff, uh, the it, silver made more sense because it was cheaper and you actually it felt like you could get more. But nowadays when you're, everyone's just buying an ETF or allocating in that or through futures, it doesn't really matter. Having said yeah. that, Patrick, it's still a, uh, you know, a precious metal. It's still, or semi-precious, maybe you could consider it. I, I think it's showing signs that there's some real dislocations happening in the market. Oh, for and sure. I someone, like, someone, I like, someone hit the bid, right? Like, Yeah, so I like it down here. I think that it's probably, yeah. you should be looking to uh, buy silver. Yeah. I think that this will be... Uh, so an opportunity that we'll look back and go, geez, I wish I had picked up some yeah. silver at twelve bucks. We uh, we took some, we got some leaps at big picture trading uh, on long silver down here. So it's oh, okay. I'm with you, yeah. And so I, now I wanted to move on and um, talk about uh, some of the indices because we we always stare at the S and P and the and the Dow and we see this big drop. But I really wanted to just take a moment to really look at some of the different global indices. I really wanted to focus just on four of them in particular, but th this is just the Canadian uh, market using the XIU. And uh, yeah, it, we just had the same extraordinary 30 plus percent drop uh, in Canada. And that's pretty much the same right across the world, right? Like it's it's been a pretty uh, ugly uh, stock market everywhere. We were hanging in there better, though, Patrick, on the until, first, uh, until oh, no, the oil happened. shock. And it all happened at once. 
Right, but the, the no, speed but you, of the you, drop here was even um, more rapid because it's sort of like it was it was a, a performing better, performing better, and it had the tailwind of the the fact that uh, the Canadian dollar was weakening, and so it was holding in, holding in, and then the oil just it just right. collapsed. I hundred percent agree. I've talked right. about this before, but I actually think that the oil shock, that deflationary shock, was not just worse for Canada; it was worse for the world in in many ways. It was the ultimate um, kind of, let's just say, event that took the financial sell-off that we were experiencing from the virus and turned it into a crisis. Yeah. I, and, I, and, I, and I I still contend that we would be in much better shape today had we not experienced that massive deflationary shock from that. Yeah, And Canada sure. especially is, is bearing the brunt of it. Oil stocks have gone. You know, there's quality stocks, Patrick, that have been – Cut by two thirds, three quarters in the in the course of this week. The pain has been unbelievable. Alberta, which is our kind of Texas for here in Canada, is going to be suffering unbelievably. It's 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 dogs and cats living together kind of uh, crisis. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, what, what I also wanted to talk about was uh, the Europe, the Euro stock. And uh, so I'm using the here, the FEZ Euro stock ETF. But that was um, a 40 percent drop. And, uh, no, and but uh, that's not really fair. You're making this worse because you're using it with the uh, with the Euro like you're putting that in U.S. dollars. No, I, enough, actually, no, I'm, no, no, no. I, I, I looked at uh, the percentage on the Euro stock index itself, no, not this one. And I would just oh, show okay. the chart oh, okay. here. Oh, okay. So okay. It, it was a it was a forty percent drop. Uh, right. And uh, what what I wanted to though point out was that this was uh, on the main index. It, it, it looks like there's a number of these little bullish white candles uh, here on uh, on this. But when you actually look at the main index, the Euro stock, this was the first uptick that it had uh, or reversal up. I mean, it was sustained selling on that index till today. Today was its first reversal day uh, after wiping out 40% of the downside. Another thing that was interesting, uh, I don't, I, I, at least as far as my charts go back, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this was the single largest percentage drop in the Euro stock in one fluid motion uh, in, uh, since uh, the charts go back, I, as far as I can go. It's, oh, because uh, they don't have 87 in there. Yeah, and so so the, the euro stock uh, was it was the euro stock even created in, in, during eighty seven? You don't know, do you? No, no, because it would have been multiple. It would have been multiple yeah. countries. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, you'd have to go to the German DAX or something. Yeah. Uh, you'd have to go right. find you'd some of the. Indiv- and so, so the point though is, is that this is uh, one of the greatest percentage drops uh, in that index's history. Yeah, uh, I looked up uh, Patrick. I went to the dictionary and I looked up shit the bed, and they had a picture of the euro stock index in there. Um, <laughs> It's unbelievable how bad it is, and I just said unbelievable again. I won't. I won't do that again. That'll be the last time. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think the problem really was that the Germans, for the longest time, were holding their, you know, their uh, their wallets tightly shut again and, and not spending. And it took a long time for them to realize that this is this is the crisis that they needed to to actually whip out the money and do something with. And even the ECB yeah. was kind of late to do it. Uh, I will tell you this, Patrick. If this is the crisis that causes them to spend, I'm bullish. I'm bullish, Europe. I'm hoping that this this yeah. if I if I see enough spending out of Europe, I, I I'll call it right here. I could see a situation where European stocks outperform uh, U.S. stocks going yeah. forward. So I wanted to show uh, uh, two of the troubled uh, areas. Like this was the forty percent wipeout in Italy. Right. So, I mean, but it's in line with what happened in um, in the broader Europe indices, but the Italian index just getting completely hammered. And then what I wanted to even show is like the the Greek index uh, is down like 50 percent. I think it was. Hold on. Let's just take an actual look at the the percentage drop here. Yeah. Fifty five percent. for the from Patrick, the top you're making me bullish, bud. you're making me want to go buy those things. I'm telling you, those those are gonna those are gonna be stuff you should buy. As long as the Germans spend, this is gonna be stuff you want to own. I know, I know. All of your yeah, Italy's but it just might be like, it just might be a little early. But yes, uh, that's I, all. Like uh, that's look, like our theme is yeah. you always just tell me I'm early. Yeah, but you know what? Once it's been shaved fifty percent, uh, I mean, actually, no. <laughs> let me take that back. Because the Greek index dropped ninety percent and then dropped another ninety percent after I that. <laughs> so, so like it, it's. 
anyway, but uh, so so the the one thing I wanted to just mention is uh, uh, our little Deutsche Bank stake bet. Oh uh, God, here we uh, go. And and uh, I just wanted to point out that you are a lucky piece of shit uh, because. This thing just uh, did this little um, uh, gap higher and gap down, allowing you to cash in the bet, and then it yeah. slams lower right to uh, uh, printing four dollars and uh, and ninety nine cents, making would have m- made me right. It, uh, wh- what was that news that came out that caused it to gap higher anyway? Like it was it was, it was somebody was buying it. Somebody was buying it. Some and, uh, and so was, uh, you just got lucky. I I oh was going, okay. So you Patrick, know what? Here, what, what? Listen. Why don't you go the whole way and tell me the other thing you said about the home builders and the TLT? Why don't you go oh. ahead? Just like, just get it all out of your system. Yeah. Well, well okay. No, I was going to get to the home builders. That was the next okay. chart. I was. Well, just uh, do it. Go, and then I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what I want to tell you. All right. Well, look at this. The home builders slammed 55 percent of the downside or more. Like it was just a slaughter. I mean, Toll Brothers, Leonard. Uh, uh, Dr. Horton, you name it, they're all just getting the shit kicked out of them, and um, you know what? Uh, being long bonds worked, and uh, and it, you know I, I think I would have been just fine. I just my, my timing was off on this. Bet. Right. So first of all, I'm going to give you you're just early, um, <laughs> but then I'm going to say that when you told me this, I'm going to tell you what I told you then. Yeah, okay, you have a a once-in-a-century virus pandemic, and then you sit there and tell me, see, I told you I was right. I didn't. I didn't. (laughs) I'm just saying, we're talking about settlement of bets here. I, I... I I was bullish bonds not because of a coronavirus. Uh, I just thought interest rates were structurally going to keep going lower. I was uh, it, that, that was one of my, my better calls. And um, and the home builders, you just got lucky. That's all. That's that's what happens. <laughs> so I love the home builders down here. Yet another chart that's been halved that I love. I'm buying yeah. them down here. I like them. Uh, well, listen. I, I mean, you zero I interest rates higher. and uh, oh, and yeah. Yeah, it, like but what again. What what I feel is going to happen is obviously there's going to be a huge spike in unemployment because when when you have this um, thing we're going to have record probably historic spikes in un- unemployment in the next two months it's already being priced into the market so it's not I don't think the market's going to be shocked by it unless it was worse than the market's pricing in and and the it, it's going to need that fiscal spend and everyone back to work and with interest rates down at where they are mortgage rates are going to be really low then there will be a huge comeback in the space but i again you're just early uh it, it's it, it yeah. probably can still get a little worse but pro- you know what probably three to six months from now backing up the truck and loading up on home builders is going to be um it, you're going to be stupid not to uh, i think uh, you're going to be stupid not to buy them now really okay yeah That's all right all right I... okay so so you want to show we have a, a gentleman's bet here well we we don't do anything as gentlemen but we will we'll bet a burger uh, no, no let, sure. let's 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 uh let's make a, a burger bet Okay. That three months from now, yeah. that uh, there will be a better, uh, there would have been a better entry than having bought today. Yeah, okay. well, that means that it has to go straight up, otherwise I lose. No, 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 because <laughs> we're going uh, to lower lows. Uh, so no, you're not let's just, just go. Th- let's just go three months from now. Is it higher or lower from here? That's what I'm saying. Okay, that's fine. So three months from now is it higher or lower? Twenty six and a uh, where, where is it right now? Twenty six, twenty nine. All right. And so three bet. months. So so um, June twentieth. All right. June. Do I do a steak? No. Okay. No a burger bet. Well, let's okay. let's save the. Uh, I want to I want to make some bigger bets so that we'll put some steak on the line. I think a burger bet is a is a good one here. Okay. Done. Uh, all right. Uh, anyway, so yeah, that's uh, that's what I want to cover. Is there any? Char- oh, actually, no, no, it's not. I wanted to actually uh, just uh, look at the steepener. Hold on, it's a yield curve. I just it, like I mean, it's 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 ripping right uh, yeah and your... it should it should like this should be why I, I screwed this up i should have bought this and forgot about it this yeah. is what i've always said the the steepener is the thing you just buy and forget yeah about. but it's a bull steeping not a bear steeping like you thought you're well, actually correct. no that's not that well initially it well is, but if, yeah. if it's if it's the, if it's going to continue it will you're gonna you're gonna get uh, the bear steepening the one thing that you and i always agree on is the fact that you tell me there's going to be financial repression and i always agree that there will be financial repression in real rates at the front end of the curve without yeah. a doubt 100 percent agree and it'll manifest itself with a steeper curve okay 
All right. I'm not going to fight it. All right. Okay. So uh, that is talking yeah. charts, buddy. Right. So what do we got now? All right. Time for uh, one of my favorite segments is uh, the WTF clip of the week, Kevin. Uh, so you uh, you dug one up this week. Uh, you, had, you made some time. I did my job. I did it early. <laughs> it was actually uh, it was something that happened last Friday, Patrick. It was um, our good old buddy Lou Dobbs, who's on Fox News. He got uh, he was talking about the big rally because think back a week from now, a week back. This was the big rally that occurred at three thirty. Remember the yeah. S and P? What did it jump? Eight percent in the in yeah. like the last thirty minutes. Something just stupid, right? Yeah. Um, Trump had a, a press conference and the market took off. And what does Trump do? He signs the chart and sends it off to Lou Jobs. I shit you not. Like, I'm telling you, he honestly did. So I saw this on Twitter and I thought to myself, no way. Someone's making that up. They've like they've gone and they've doctored it. Right. Like they've taken a chart and they photoshopped it on. So I went and I and I said to myself, no, this is going to be an example of, of the liberal left media, you know, twisting things that Trump does. And I said to myself, I got to go find it to show them that's wrong. So I go and I find the Fox News clip and it's true. Honest to goodness, Donald Trump sent off a sign chart of he goochered it. He goochered and it for everybody. He, he did goocher it for everyone. Now. Before anyone gets too mad at me saying I'm picking on Trump and I'm picking on, uh, you know, Fox News. First of all, we I am an equal opportunity uh, political satirist. I think there's nobody funnier to make fun of than Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Sock boy. He's got all sorts of ridiculousness. It is. I, I do not just hold this out for Trump. And when it comes yeah, you to you equally hate all politicians, you don't. Yeah, you don't... well, most of them are most of them are knobs. And I just don't want you to think that I'm picking on Trump or I'm picking on the U.S. Our our guy is a complete and utter buffoon as well. OK. All right. But let's watch and it. then and, well, no, 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 I got to okay. set one other thing up, Patrick. So one of the things is then it was Fox News. And I was thinking about this and I was thinking about Fox News. It's kind of a ridiculous show. And um, I thought to myself. You know, I got to go see Bombshell. My my wife asked me if we wanted to go see Bombshell. And Bombshell is this show about uh, the kind of these three women that were hosts at uh, Fox News and what they did. And any time you put together Charlie Theron, Nicole Kidman, and Margot Robbie into a movie, I'm like sold. Like I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm running across the pit screaming sold, sold, sold. So I thought I'd just take this opportunity since, you know what, that's a good movie in terms of uh, – enjoyable for me so i thought i'd just kind of mash it up with that so that's that's how this came about so without further ado here is lou dobbs and the bombshell mashup on wall street today stocks skyrocketing the you have to adopt the mentality of an irish street cop the world is a bad place people are lazy morons minorities are criminals sex is sick but interesting Dow Jones Industrials climbing 1,985 points and uh, doing so as the president began his uh, news conference this afternoon. Ask yourself what would scare my grandmother or piss off my grandfather. And that's a Fox story. Oh. Uh, on the public-private uh, partnerships uh, that uh, he has assembled to take on the coronavirus. Uh, you may have heard there was a dust-up involving yours truly and presidential contender Donald Trump. There was blood coming out of her eyes, blood coming out of her wherever. Oh, my God. I... Did he just accuse me of anger menstruating? Wait. Uh, the S&P up 230, the Nasdaq up 673, all three indexes, the largest one-day point increase ever, volume on the big board above 8 billion shares once again. And by the way, another $2 trillion returned to the markets. Thanks. It could kill Fox News. We need everyone on Team Roger. Get it on. Put it on. The president celebrating his uh, signature uh, day today. The White House sent along uh, to me a, uh, a, uh, <laughs> a sign chart of the skyrocketing Dow, the S&P 500 and NASDAQ. Uh, that, uh, the, the Dow, by the way, rose more than 1,000 points. Uh, from the time he started talking uh, to the time the news conference, his news conference was over with his decisive announcement to declare the coronavirus pandemic a national emergency. 
well received by markets uh, all, all around the world, I'm sure. Sweetheart, this is an island of safety and truth. <laughs> I still can't believe he did it. Like, I'm just he shocked. It. He gooched it. He gooched it. He you did like go it. it. You should never do that. And the funny you never, thing about it, you, ne- you never take a victory lap till. Uh, yeah. And then the funny thing about it is that we were limit down uh, Sunday night. Yeah. It couldn't. He, his, his, he, he couldn't even last. Like his rally didn't even last thirty seconds once the market opened again. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, it's, it's, it's just it's, it's insane. But at least I did my job, Patrick. I did the WTF this week. Maybe this will be. <laughs> watch out. Maybe I'll even get two in a row next week. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm going to be impressed. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. It's time for the top three things to watch next week. But before we do, let's review what we talked about last week. And so uh, the one thing that we uh, asked was, was the dollar bull back on? I think we just covered this quite extensively in the charts. Though. I think that we don't need to add anything here. Uh, well, I think we should say that it's not only like we talked about the emerging markets, but even on the Dixie, it's back on. And uh, I I was yep. probably t- bearish dollars because usually I am. I was wrong. Like this is a full on panic in in terms of getting U.S. dollar. Um, the the as I, I mentioned earlier about the Brent uh, sent Brent uh, yep. Johnson Santiago milkshake crew. They are their theory is coming through in spades. And well, but they they also thought though the equities were going to benefit from it, and they're not. So they're only well, partially. Well, that's true. Right. That that is true. The one thing I will say, and 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 this actually makes me hopeful that we're getting near the end. I originally saw you saw the um, the the volatility in the S and P go up. Then you saw the volatility in the bonds go up, and now we finally had the volatility in the dollar. That was the longest yeah. time it was the it was it was one sleeping. of your one of your best calls. Uh, one of my favorite one of your best calls was the being long currency volatility. It was, uh, it was stupid cheap and you had, you banged it. It was, you were bang on. Yeah. Well, thanks. You know, even the blind squirrel catches in the right corner every now and then. Yeah. What do we got for number two? Uh, what well, was the reaction to the FOMC and it didn't, it didn't even wait till Wednesday, right? It happened on the weekend. It was, and it was the, what was the mother of all bazookas that was a dud. Like they missed. They I shot the dis- bazooka. I disagree with you there. All you right, really go for that? it. You no, I don't know. They- I'm just, Look, yeah, I mean, the, if, they, if they wanted a market reaction, they got the wrong one that they expected. Well, I think I what would it have been the alternative? I, I disagree completely because uh, all sorts of markets had stopped working and yeah. and they th- without them, this would have we would have had 87. I, I, I completely I completely will take the other side of that. They needed to do that. Not only that, they've actually been reacting quite well in terms of increasing the speed upon which they doing all their QEs. People don't understand okay, but how dysfunctional Kev, Kev, the market has become. In 1987, the market dropped 35% altogether. We're down over 30%. I mean, how is this not 87? This is the this is just well, because of one no, one day drop of 20%. I mean, we saw in global currencies there were numerous emerging market equity markets that did 20% limit down in one day um, last week. And so, uh, to me, it was a global 1987. Uh, it just because the U.S. equity uh, market Market took it in several steps rather than one super ugly day that basically froze up down 13% or something like that. Uh, I, I think it was at an 87, dude. Okay, I won't disagree with you there. I think that it would have been a lot worse without the Fed, though. I don't think that they... I don't think that they messed up. I actually feel that everything. Oh, done- I don't think they messed up. I mean, I, it had to be done. The the situation, yeah. uh, they couldn't do this in a slow, measured way. The mar- when the market is chaotic, you you have to you have to give the market participants a vote of confidence that you, that you guys are trying to do everything and every anything and everything right. Right, and and the one thing I will say, Patrick, is that I I was very critical of the Fed um, when they were slow to react. What, three weeks ago, I wrote a, a scathing piece that I, I said, these guys don't understand, they don't get it, this is a humanitarian thing, this isn't a financial thing, once you wait for the data, it's too late, blah, 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 blah. And so I, uh, I am the first one to kind of crap all over the Fed. However, I, I strongly take the other side of the idea that they haven't... Uh, that they're not on top of this and they're not doing everything they can. Like I, you know, I wrote about this today, Patrick, but 
I get their um, updates from you know when they email uh, what their purchases were every day. Usually, I got two or three a week. I feel like I'm getting spammed by like uh, the Fed's trying to sell me something because every like two hours I'm getting a new update about what they've bought. It's just yeah. continual, just monster, monster blue tickets that they're writing. And even then, the market's having trouble digesting it. And I and I just think without their bids, where would this stuff be? Yeah. You would have seen bonds go down even more. You would have seen a wholesale liquidation. They are they are doing everything they can. People think that they bought five hundred. You know, they did five hundred million a QE, and they announced that they've actually front loaded it. They didn't tie their hands in terms of when they were going to do it. They they're doing more and more every day until it, this is going to finally stabilize. I give them full full marks that they're actually handling the situation as best they can. After being asleep at this wheel, they're finally woken up and they're staring at the road and they're and they're dealing with the situation. That's my take. There you go. All right, so let's uh, do number one, which is the uh, a market bounce next week. Well, we have been bouncing, but it's been pretty pathetic. Uh, so here's the S and P. We have we've had intraday lows. And each time the market tries to rally, it it uh, makes a, a a break higher, and the sellers hit it, and it brings it right back down. And then they rallied again, and the sellers hit it again. And it's the market stopped going down in the middle of the week, but it uh, but the rally the other way. I would have thought there would have been more velocity on the upside, and especially we had a huge dealer gamma roll off going here into the Friday close. We we still haven't seen what, what, the way we we're going to close here, but uh, there is no reaction. There we we're not, the market the market is just muddling along here, and uh, yeah, it's it I don't know, Patrick. You think this is bad, but I remember a week ago when we had the big, huge, emotional rally that yeah. Don, Donald jumped, uh, Donald Trump, uh, Trump, <laughs> Donald Trump. I said Donald Trump signed his autograph to that because he was so convinced the bottom was in. I would rather see this sort of muddling around as we grope to find a bottom than this kind of, you know complete and utter shoot up yeah. that, that we've had in the past. And not only that, I, I, I'm kind of welcoming the fact that here we are, we're writing this. It's down, the S&P's down 15 handles. This would be great, Patrick. If, even if we just, if we started to only go down 15 handles a day, this would be the greatest thing ever. Oh, come on. This, uh, stop it. That's just randomness. I mean, we've been swinging 100 no, S&P points, points but, intraday. Uh, no, so just you're, because but, you're, you're... No, 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 no. Okay, I agree. That we've been swinging a lot, but uh, we've been swinging less and less over the past week. And uh, volatility is pr the one thing that I think will happen next week is uh, volatility will narrow. I think these right. really and big ranges. Is, and this is what I'm saying. I think this is a good thing. And mm. I, I, I contend that the days, hopefully, of these multiple like down. Four, five percent lock limit down, then down seven, and then we're closing in this, or even the ups. I don't want to see an up five. I I don't want to see that. I'd actually much rather we settle down here and we just grind and climb a wall of worry by going up or down. You know, twenty thirty points. There's nothing would make me happier, and I think that this is the the beginning. I'm hopeful. I'm not saying it's for sure in. But I'm hopeful that this is the start of creating a, 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 a tradable bottom. You know, one thing that I, well, I, even if it's a tradable bottom, I don't think it's going to be the bear market low. And that's why I was happy to take that I, ITB, um, and like the home builder bet with you. I, 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 I'm looking for a short term low. There's no doubt about it. I'm with you on that camp. I just don't think that this is going to be just a, a, the buy and you uh, load up everything. I know you're a little more. Uh, courageous about making a call like that, but I'm not in. I'm not in that camp. Okay, well we'll see. Yeah. I, I, right. I I very well could be wrong, and I'm usually early. All right, so let's uh, move on to the uh, top three things to watch next week. And so the the first thing that I wanted to talk about is gold, and this idea of uh, will gold follow the um, uh, analog from 2008. So just to kind of uh, give everyone a, a summary of what happened back then, let's, let's just see if I can pull up uh, on the 20 year. There you go. And so, so right in here in the um, 2008 window, gold, gold rallied significantly up until into the recession of 2008. And then it dropped 35% 
on the downside during the 2008 year and then became a screaming buy that, uh, as QE was running uh, and and went ripping from uh, from its lows down about 700 bucks all the way to 1900 bucks on the upside. And so the question I wanted to ask was, are we going to run with that kind of an analog, which is essentially uh, a, a 30 plus percent pullback in gold is basically down b- down back to 1100 where this whole thing began. Do we do we have that kind of pullback or is the pullback much uh, more shallow and uh, and will we only let's say retest to here like 13 1400 levels where we're at and then that's where the screaming buying opportunity comes from uh what's your bias i think it's going to be a lady gaga special man this is going to be shallow like you've never seen before and and the reason that i say that is because we are um the federal reserve and all central banks were slow in the 2008 crisis to uh, liquefy the system. And there's many reasons for that. They didn't understand it because it was the first time that they got bound by the negative rate. And then second of all, it was, it was banksters that they were saving. It wasn't, they weren't saving the average person. So when I look at the current situation, the, the central banks have the moral justification to buy whatever it takes and that ultimately is going to be gold positive. I do not think it's going to be an analog of the 2008 situation. I think it's going to start to get a bid way before that because there's a, a wave of blue tickets coming from central banks, baby. I'm, uh, I'm with you. Uh, maybe our time frames will be a little bit different. I just don't think it's going to be as deep. Uh, and uh, it's and the one thing I think we do both agree on is that it is going to be a, a compelling buying opportunity, and so uh, we'll watch. But what's amazing is that on things like bonds and gold and and currencies, just the way that the implied volatilities have blown out, it's like putting on option strategies on on gold is it's nuts. Like I mean, it went from like uh, almost single digit implieds. To I think I saw the front month had like a 60 implied on gold. You basically, it's very difficult to be a buyer of any option strategy right now because you're you're paying you're paying a, yeah. a ridiculous uh, premium. Yeah. Very right? difficult. Like it's very difficult. You you have to have some strategy in place that that is offsetting the volatility if you wanted to do that. And right. uh, but it's uh, it's it's uh, still an amazing opportunity. So number two, I wanted to talk about oil. Uh, and uh, one of the as obviously we had a nasty breakdown. Let me just uh, pull up a chart here. Uh, and we had a we had a nasty breakdown uh, to uh, lows that exceeded 2016. We broke to 20 bucks, the tw- 20 handle anyway, on the downside of uh, of oil. And uh, and we were not that far off from that low, trading around 23. And there was a London Times article. That was suggesting that on the short term, on the front month, obviously, spot prices that we could see negative oil prices. And I'm a, I'm a seller on that idea. But, yeah. it, uh, but, but the thing is, is that it really does show how this global recession, uh, it's basically the world is shut down because of the coronavirus. And, uh, and so where are they, what are they going to do with all this oil that's not being used? Uh, it, it does put on that front, it, it could leave the... the curve and monster contango on the term structure and uh and i would guess the front month oil can keep going lower during this period but do you have an opinion do you th- you think we're going under 20 i'm hesitant to say that it's not gonna ha- that's not gonna happen like uh, i guess i did a double negative there but um yes it could different we could go to under 20 the, the reality is that the saudis and russians whether who is really driving this who knows they're intent on breaking the back of American shale. Yeah. And I actually think that it was really it was orchestrated by the Russians. Putin is a very, very slippery fella. He has chosen a moment of weakness in the um, financial kind of calamity from the virus to attack America on the uh, kind of economic front. And I... I Patrick, uh, never say never, because I could see him pushing it down below 20. I, I, I would have never thought we would have gotten here. But now that I see how intent he is on doing this, I see what the Saudis are doing when they're going out and leasing tankers and shipping this off. They're continuing to supply as much oil as they can. 
it's ugly. It's desperate. And, uh, I'm, you know, I'm usually one to stick my hand out there and try to catch things. This is not one of the ones that I want to catch. Now, having said that, that probably means you should be buying it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. So uh, let uh, I look on the very short term. And this is the key is, is that what people have to recognize is that um, it's not all oil that's uh, going to 20 or less. It's just the front month delivery. Right. And uh, when you go out, there's crude oil prices in the mid 30s to, to 40 plus when you're going out the term structure. And so it's it's just really about the short term stress that's going to be caused on on the front. And it could get a little worse on the short term. Right. Right. So, Patrick, I will tell you one thing before I leave it on this. The longer term stuff out like so, uh, I don't know, it takes a year for them to bankrupt the American shale. I don't know what the f- number is, but let's just say if you're talking like 2022 oil or 2023 oil that you should be buying hand over fist because we're going to be shocked at the, when we eventually fix all this and on the demand side. And then all of a sudden without the supply there, it was already setting up before this uh, kind of event it was already setting up that there was no more money going into uh, oil uh, discoveries something like i remember one of our guests said for every seven barrels that we kind of burn off we only replace one well that number has just gotten a whole lot worse so yeah. i look out the far dated stuff i just be a buyer 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 well, yeah, that one of my big thesis uh, that I continue to have a big picture trading is this idea that this is going to be one of the most epic bust boom uh, cycles to make money, right? We're going through the deflationary impulse that is just uh, purging the system in a monstrous way here. and But on the other side of that is going to be uh, a, a huge fiscal spend. You, but you're the one that's uh, cheerleading that more than I am. And uh, and the bull market that will be in these kind of things on the other side is going to be awesome, and especially when you're able to buy this stuff this cheap. And uh, and it's gonna it's one of, it's going to be a, fa- a fascinating opportunity. Anyway, let's move on to number one, which was that uh, will they halt the markets this weekend? And I'm this this was you, mine. I insisted yeah. on this one because yeah, you do it. Take it from here. I I think we've been. Uh, foolish to have it open this long and now people will say we need the market it'll create too much uncertainty and people have misinterpreted the reason why i think the market should be halted i don't think it should be halted because it's going down i think it should be halted because it's sending bad signals because it's not operating efficiently and i see that uh that new york governor como just sent every non-essential people home already wall street banks and dealers were understaffed there was guys that we we would be trying to deal with them and they would be having to phone one room and then go talk to their risk manager in another room like it's shut down like it's already not going you see it with um uh you see all all the times with uh when i'm going and trading some of these etfs i'm just a little odd lotter and i'm moving the quotes around Patrick, like it just shouldn't be. The liquidity is terrible. There's nobody taking the other sides. And then when big risk parity funds get into trouble and they have to actually sell some of these things, it, it like, you know, I, I highlighted that GDXJ example. When it went to a 20% discount, the, the ETF went to a 20% discount to NAV. And it sat there all afternoon. That is the most ridiculous thing ever. All you needed to do as a dealer was to buy that and short the underlying securities, which is really just the most simplest of ARBs. And you would have netted yourself 20% overnight. And those sorts of arbitrages just never exist in a real, in a properly functioning environment. And this is my point. We're long past a properly functioning environment. And why we insist on keeping this open is just ridiculousness and bravado of the first order. Now, some people say it's going to make it worse if we halt it. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. You know what? I, I'd almost rather just halt it for two weeks, let everyone think about things and then come back. And if they sell it down 20 or 40, 30% at that time, so be it. But at least maybe the market could be functioning better. So I go back to, I really think there's a decent chance this weekend that they halt it because of the fact that even New York uh, has said that they should send home all non-essential uh, personnel. And yeah. we'll see if I'm right. I, so far, I've been just like screaming at the clouds and it hasn't been right. But uh, so be it. I think it's something to watch and it's something to keep on your radar. All right. You heard it here from Kevin Muir. <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> 
Patrick's like, I want nothing to do with that one. I'm not, I, I, well, you know what? If it happens, it, it's it's going to be shit. Uh, I like I won't imagine for two weeks without having a stock market open. Well, what would it do well, with my life? Listen, Patrick, <laughs> the, I'll tell you this: stock market already is is is. They say it's open, but it's barely open. Like in terms of uh, how efficient yeah. it's operating. So yeah, be it. Yeah. That's what makes market. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Yeah, there you go. All right, Kev, time for the parting words of wisdom. So, Patrick, I just wanted to remind everyone to stay safe out there. I've been hearing lots of terrible stories of, from our, our friends in New York City about uh, people coming down with the virus. It's spreading faster than, than I would have been aware of. And uh, above all else, you know, we, we, we focus on markets. We like talking about markets, but uh, nothing's more important than your health and the health of your family and those you love. So just uh, I wish everyone stay safe and, uh, and uh, make sure you take care of yourselves. All right. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's it. That's a wrap for the show, right? So uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, we appreciate uh, your time and hope uh, to see you again next week. Uh, but before uh, you leave, it was just a quick thank you to uh, David Keller for uh, joining us for this week's episode. Um, as well, uh, you could follow us here on uh, Twitter at the Market Huddle. Make sure you do a follow. Uh, what That's else? Right. Is there, it's Kev? actually one second. I, I want to say something. Lena's in charge of the Market Huddle now and uh, the Twitter. It's getting better all the time. I see stuff in there and it's it's awesome. Make sure you follow that. Make sure you follow myself at Kevin Muir and follow Patrick at Patrick Ceresna. And finally, on the last note, big thanks to Rob Coifin at uh, at uh, Coifin Financial. It's been uh, a pleasure having him as a sponsor. And make sure you check out his product at koyfin.com. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, and uh, enjoy your weekend. Lena, hop on. Hello. Hi. So Patrick's going to leave us. He's got work to do. Yeah. Oh, he doesn't have anything. So see you later. Yeah. Lena so, and I'll chat. <laughs> Enjoy, guys. say bad things about you. <laughs> All, right. All right. Cheers, guys. See you. Bye-bye. Oh, gosh. The um, What do you got planned for this weekend? Wow. More work. <laughs> I've actually been more... I've been busier than... I guess in the last couple of months than I have been in a very long time. Oh, why is that? With all the stuff going on. Because, um, you know, everybody wants to do more news about the oh, virus and whatnot. Oh, some virus so, editing. Yes. Okay. So for me, it's it's a busy time. Well, for a lot of people, they're going nuts in the house with their kids. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I, I, I know we send ours out to uh, try to do stuff like I send them out to to skateboard and to do non-social stuff I feel like it's a little bit like uh, the like when polio was around and uh, my dad tells this Jesus well no my dad tells me the story of like you would go out and you couldn't play with certain, like you know you weren't supposed to play with kids and all this stuff like he remembers that and well my dad had polio oh did he oh yeah yeah he had a polio when he was I can't remember but he when he was very very young but um, yeah. Well, my dad, my dad's family, they ended up buying a cottage because they remembered, uh, they found out that it was, uh, or they suspected it was transmitted through pools, which it ended up being. So they were like, "We got to get out of the city." And he grew up in Montreal, and so they went out and bought a cottage, and they would just take him up to the cottage every time to try to get him away from it. It's amazing, actually, wow. how we've taken for granted some of these things in terms of. Uh, you know, we think our lives are so easy. And, like, I know another thing that um, that I take for granted. I was born just at the tail end of uh, the Vietnam War. But let's face it, most of us that are, that are alive today have not really had to deal with a war. And when you talk to our old, no. older... Well, not, not, at least not in the Western world, anyway. Yeah, that's right. You're absolutely right there. But it's in, when you talk to some people about this, you're just like, oh, my goodness, like, it's taking it for granted. And I hope it's not one of these things as well that... Uh, we look back and go, oh, we didn't realize how good we had it back then. Yeah. Yeah. It is It is pretty surreal just like watching, you know, the prime minister make his press conferences every day. And I'm just like, I feel like I'm in a movie. Yeah. You know, well, like I feel like I'm in like an outbreak or contagion or one of those pandemic movies. Like I just, this is surreal to me. So I will say one thing that, you know, um, our grandparents, they asked them to go and like put them fight in the mm -hmm. battle on Normandy, and they're asking us to sit on our couch for two weeks. 
Yeah. So I, and and in a day in an age where you know you can still connect through FaceTime yeah, or it's not you know, that through bad. email and phone calls, yeah. it's really not that bad. Okay, so listen, let's talk um, about something more fun than this. This is a, I I took us down a dark road. I, you know, it was a dark, <laughs> a dark road, and let's talk about something more fun. What are you watching? You know what? Let's get some. Uh, everyone's going to be at home more and more. Uh, Netflix slash Amazon slash Apple TV. What are your favorite shows you're watching? What do you got for us that you recommend? I actually just finished watching Dirty Money on Netflix. Oh, what's that? There's two seasons. It's it's a documentary. It's a docu series, I guess you would call yeah. it. Yeah. Um, it's about financial crimes. Oh. Very, yeah. very, very fitting. So some of the stuff that we probably covered in the <laughs> show in the past year so or so. So Dirty Money, and it's good, is it? I th- I thought it was excellent. Oh, okay. I I I enjoyed it a lot. Well, that's cool. So. And then what about uh, you finished Succession yet? Yeah, 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 I finished both seasons. Okay, so, so you're you're I, all. Up. I'm hoping the third season will come out soon because I'm actually starting to run out of things to watch. Oh, okay. <laughs> Have you watched Dairy Girls? No, oh. that's like the that's a UK show, right? Yeah. Like the British show. So listen, about... go watch Dairy Girls. Best show, best Dairy show, Girls. yeah, best show on Netflix. Is it like comedy? Yeah, it's complete comedy. And listen, if you're the kind okay. of person that has trouble with like Irish accents, you might not like it. Some people. Oh, I watch everything with subtitles. I, oh, I see, <laughs> I don't understand. Okay, so there you go. Like, can you explain to me this because my kids do this as well? It's obviously a millennial slash whatever that next generation is. Why do you guys do it? It's like it's crazy. I don't understand it. Well, for me, um, for me personally, our TV is a little bit far away from the couch. Yeah. So with that, if I don't crank up the volume really loud, it's sometimes hard to hear, and I don't, I don't like loud noises. Okay. So if I have subtitles, it's like I can still listen, but if if, if I miss something, I'll read it on the subtitles, and then I just got used to it. I won't watch like YouTube videos or anything else with subtitles, but then when I watch TV at home, it's always with subtitles, and I just got used to it. Um. Okay, so watch that. And then there's another one that, um, let me just see. There's another Netflix one that I can't remember. It's something with, uh, oh, God, it, it is, like, it's like another teen movie kind of thing. Ah. <laughs> Anyways, why don't you give me one while I'm looking this up? I also recently watched Doctor Sleep. Yeah, is that good? With Ewan McGregor. Um, it's... I guess it's more of a sequel to The Shining. Oh, that's my yeah. daughter wants me to watch it. Is it good? It's good. Yeah? It's good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. If you if you like The Shining, you would probably enjoy this. Oh. It's a little bit. It's not as good, I would say, as far as like thriller factor. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's still good. Okay, I'm gonna. It I, still has a lot of like old Kubrick elements into it okay well i'm gonna watch that for sure and i and i'll give you one last tip for me here it's it's called the end of the fucking world trailer or sorry trailer i'm telling you i'm reading i'm like patrick (laughs) you're looking at the trailer right now (laughs) ron Ron burgundy i'm as bad as patrick patrick goes into the i i think i know which one that is i i don't think i've watched it but i i think i've seen yeah so go watch that uh, end of the fucking world and then uh dairy girls so you go watch those and report back (laughs) <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm, I'm actually waiting for Westworld to finish their season. They just started their, I think it's the third season. I really enjoyed their first two. Okay. Uh, have you ever seen Westworld? No, I never got into HBO? it. I should get into it. I've never did it. I thought it was an, I thought it was a very interesting show. Okay. Um, yeah, the third season started, I think. Well, so. I have a feeling that there's gonna, we're going to have a lot more time to watch these, so I'm going to put that on my list as well. Well, we also got VR. <laughs> What's V? Oh, virtual reality? Yeah, we got those VR goggles. You did it. Um, when this sort of, you know, lockdown sort of was starting to unfold, we got a couple of VR goggles. And because um, we knew we were going to run out of things to watch on Netflix or other TV platforms very quickly. And we needed some other form of entertainment. So uh, are you playing games with your VR? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's in a way we're like, oh, it's going to get us to move around a little more than just kind of vegging on the couch and watching TV. And it it, it definitely has. My arms are sore today. <laughs> <laughs> I, so. I, I'm like an idiot. I My son takes me to like one, like the Microsoft store and he makes me put it on and I just feel like I'm sw- like swatting at the sky and I feel like a complete buffoon. 
Like that's a j- well. When you're in it, yeah, you think, like I just you think it I just so like cool, right? Yeah, I can't do it. Like it's like that's just something. That's a generational thing. It, uh, oh, I watched Luke play last night, and I was I could I couldn't stop laughing. Yeah, he's like, oh, I'm 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 being a Jedi. <laughs> this is great. Like, you know, he's talking through the whole thing. He's like, ooh, look at me go, blah blah blah. And I'm just watching him with his goggles on and yeah. just swaying his arms around, he's like, uh, and turning around. And he's like Michael. Uh, um, uh, what's his name uh, from Arrested Development? Do you remember? Did you watch Arrested uh, Development? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I love yeah. the show. Which, uh, so, what's Michael Sarah's character's name? Uh, George, George Michael. Michael. <laughs> remember when George Michael uh, has the video of him playing uh, uh, Jedi in the garage? Oh! So you can tell <laughs> Luke that he's like. Uh, send him, send him that video. Tell him that's what he looks like. Okay. Anyways, oh my God. I should let you go. I have to go do some things as well. Anyways, it's great. Uh, yep. It's a great chat with you. It's better without Patrick. We should do this every time. Yeah, probably. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't have much to contribute right. to this anyway. <laughs> I'll see you later. Have a great night.